This is Audible. Ruthless, The House of Rohan, by Anne Stewart, narrated by Susan Erickson. Copyright 2010 by Anne Christine Stewart Olrog. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Anne Stewart, care of Dystel and Goderich Literary Management, and was produced in the year 2011 by Tantor Media Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. Beginning Paris 1768 the visit with the lawyer had not gone well. Eleanor Harriman arrived home just as her sister Lydia had finished dealing with their landlord, and she ducked out of sight so the old lecher wouldn't see her. Monsieur Picot had no patience for either her or her mother, but her baby sister was a different matter. All Lydia had to do was let tears fill her limpid blue eyes and make her Cupid's bow mouth tremble and Monsieur Picot was destroyed, awash with apologies and assurances. He didn't realize he was being played until the door was firmly closed behind him, and Eleanor could sneak up the stairs, grateful that she hadn't had to defend Lydia's honor if Monsieur Picot got carried away. He never did. None of the landlords and butchers and greengrocers ever took advantage of Lydia's delicate beauty. She radiated such an exquisite innocence that no one would dare. Even in this less than felicitous area of town, no one would even think of offering her an insult. Told you, Lydia said with an impish grin far removed from her Madonna smile. It works every time. Eleanor flopped into the nearest chair, letting out a groan as an errant spring poked her backside. During their last enforced move, they'd had to relinquish all but their most wretched of furniture. The tiny parlor on the edge of one of the least savory neighborhoods in Paris held three chairs and a meager table that served as a desk, a dining surface, and a dressing table, and the chairs were barely functional. The bedrooms were as bad. One sagging bed in the first room held their mother's snoring body, in the other, there was only a shared mattress on the hard floor. She refused to think about how Nanny Maud or Jacobs the coachman slept in the back area that served as kitchen and servants' quarters. And how absurd it was to have a coachman when it had been years since they'd even had a horse, much less a coach. Not since their very first days in Paris, when their mother had been in love and the two sisters had reveled in their new adventure. But Jacobs had come with them from England, under Lady Caroline's spell, as most men were, and nothing, not even a total lack of wages, could induce him to leave. The lover and the money had disappeared quickly, to be replaced by someone almost as wealthy. In the last ten years, Lady Caroline Harriman had been working her way down to a state Eleanor couldn't bear to consider. At least right now, her mother was too ill to cause trouble. To go looking for another bottle of blue ruin. Another game of chance. Another man to finance her more important needs, which had never included her daughters. So how much time have we got? she asked, reaching for her knitting. She was a wretched knitter. Her handwork was atrocious, but she convinced herself she could do something useful even if her socks and vests were full of drop stitches. Nanny Maud had taught her, but as usual, she was proving less than adept. Lydia sighed. He'll be back in a week, and I don't think I'll be able to put him off again. Sweet Lydia was perfect in every way, pretty and darling and clever, and her handwork was flawless. She could dance perfectly, with only the cursory lessons their mother had once paid for. She could paint a pretty picture, sing like a bird, and any man who met her became her willing slave, from Jacobs, their elderly manservant, to the wealthy young Vicomte de Mirabeau, whom she'd met at the lending library. For a brief time, Eleanor had hoped their problems were solved, until the Vicomte's family caught wind of what was going on, and, 
and the Vicomte had been swept away on a grand tour of Europe. They'd offered her money, Eleanor thought, rubbing her chilled hands, and she'd probably been a fool to throw it back in their smug faces, as if a heroine would ever stoop to being bribed. But at that moment, with Monsieur Picot just walking away, she suddenly thought she could do almost anything if it ensured safety for Lydia and their little family, even for their reckless mother. Lady Caroline had been too ill to cause trouble recently. They had no money for a doctor or medicine, and the flush that had covered her body and disordered her never clear mind was a mixed blessing. Ill as she was, at least for the time being she was bedridden, unable to get them deeper in debt. So tell me about the lawyer, Nell, Lydia said, calling her the pet name only she used. Has our father left us some vast fortune to ease Maman's final days, or at least a minor pittance? He's left us something, though a vast fortune might be too optimistic, Eleanor said morosely. His title and estates have been left to a Mr. Marcus Harriman, and another, undoubtedly smaller amount for us. He probably wouldn't have left us anything if he could have helped it. She carefully avoided the fact that whatever inheritance existed belonged, nominally, to her. Lydia's parentage was cloudy, but most definitely had nothing to do with Eleanor's father, and everyone knew it. Though British law declared a child born within a marriage to be the legal offspring of the husband, her father had been infinitely inventive in denying either child or his ex-wife any kind of support. Lydia sighed. Perhaps Monsieur Picot would be put off another week if I allowed him a few liberties. A kiss would hardly compromise my soul if it kept a roof over our heads. No! Eleanor dropped another stitch and tossed her knitting aside in frustration. She looked up at her sister. The lawyer definitely said our father had left us something though apparently there was some ridiculous stipulation that I would have to go to England to receive it. I just wish we'd known of his death sooner. We could have put this in motion months ago. I expect the death notice would have gone to our former residence, and since we left in the middle of the night with our bills unpaid, they would have been unlikely to pass along any correspondence that might have showed up. I'm sure it won't be too miserable an amount. He wouldn't let his daughter starve. Lydia's brief smile was wry. Don't try to sweeten things for me. He always said he wanted nothing to do with the spawn of the harlot he'd had the misfortune to marry. Why should he change his mind on his deathbed? Well, he was still angry. It was only a few years after Mother had left him, and he was the laughingstock of London. Sooner or later he must remember that we are his blood, and he has some responsibility to us. I thought he claimed we aren't actually his children, didn't he? Eleanor could barely remember their father. He'd been a tall, singularly unpleasant man with little interest in anything but his horses and his women. It had always seemed patently unfair to Eleanor that his wife had been denounced for following similar interests, but she'd learned fairness had little to do with reality. Of course we're his children, she said. At least Lydia had never suspected the truth about her own parentage. I'm as tall as most men, and I have his wretched nose. It's a very nice nose, Nell, Lydia said gently. It gives you character, whereas I'm just a pretty little nothing. There are times when I would have given a great deal to be a pretty little nothing, Eleanor said morosely. No, you wouldn't. I don't really think you want to be anyone but yourself, if truth be told, Lydia said. Eleanor forced a laugh. You're probably right. I always was wretchedly strong-minded. I'd like to be exactly as I am, only fabulously wealthy. That's a reasonable enough request, isn't it? Unfortunately, the only way to obtain a fortune is to marry one, 
and the nose precludes that. A very good man would appreciate you, elegant nose and all, Lydia said firmly. And I have every intention of marrying someone fabulously wealthy, so you don't need to worry about it. You will be free to marry for love. Eleanor snorted in disbelief, a very unladylike reaction. A lovely thought, dear. But how are you going to meet this very rich man when we're living on the edge of the Paris slums? The next move will put us in the heart of them. It's going to come to that eventually, and I'm not quite sure we'll survive. I have faith, Lydia said simply. The answer will be provided when we need it. On top of everything else, Lydia was a devout Christian, whereas Eleanor had lost her faith years ago when she'd met Sir Christopher Spatz. And now she accompanied Lydia to church only as a matter of form. I think the answer is long overdue, she grumbled. If you could make it hurry up, I'd appreciate it. She heard the commotion coming from the back of the apartment, and Jacobs burst into the room, his hat in his hand, his weathered old face creased with worry, Nanny Maud close behind him. She's gone, miss, he announced. There was never any question who he was talking about. What do you mean, gone? Eleanor said, jumping up. Is she dead? No, Miss Eleanor, Nanny said, her voice thick with worry. Your mother managed to find the last of the money I'd had for food, and she put on a fancy dress and left. Oh, dear God! How did she manage that? I thought she could barely move, Eleanor said, chilled. We can find her, can't we? She can't have gotten far. I almost caught her, miss, Jacob said miserably, crushing his hat with his big strong hands. I thought I recognized her running down the streets, but she got in a coach before I could catch her. A coach? Are you sure it was my mother? I didn't realize she still knew anyone with a coach. It was her, Jacob said grimly, and I recognized the coach. Even in the streetlights I could see the crest. Oh, Lord, Eleanor moaned. What new disaster has she gotten us into? Whose was it? San Philippe. Bloody hell, Eleanor said. Don't look at me like that, Nanny Maud. I know you raised me better, but if any occasion deserved a curse, then this one does. You know who San Philippe's friend is, don't you, Jacobs? I don't, Lydia piped up, her blue eyes shining with curiosity. You don't need to know, Eleanor snapped. It's that devil, isn't it? Nanny said, her voice grim. She's gone and taken herself off to the devil's lair, where there's orgies and such, and she'll lose the tiny bit of money we have left and probably end up sacrificed to the dark one. I don't think they do sacrifices, Nanny, Eleanor said in her most practical voice, trying to ignore her own racing heart. They do, Nanny said, nodding her head so vigorously her lace cap slipped off her silver hair. Women go in there and are never seen again. They kill virgins and drink their blood. Well, if it's virgins they kill, then I think our mother's safe, Eleanor drawled, determined to take the terrified look off her sister's face. And I doubt anyone will be so besotted with her that she'll disappear. She'll gamble away the money and then come crawling home, sick and helpless. You don't understand, miss, said Nanny. It's the only money we have left. And she took the diamond brooch. A cold chill ran down the center of Eleanor's body. It was the last thing of value they owned. A poor piece with tiny flawed diamonds that was worth very little, but she'd kept it hidden for an emergency that didn't involve their deliberately self-destructive mother. She straightened her shoulders. Then I'll simply have to go after her. She ignored Nanny's howl of protest.
Jacob said nothing. He knew there was no other choice. Lydia rose. I'm going with you, Nell. You certainly are not. If I walk into that den of iniquity, I know I'm safe. They'd be on you like a pack of ravening wolves. I think you overestimate my irresistibility, Lydia said with a grin. And I think you underestimate it. Nanny said they'd drink the blood of virgins, remember? She said, with just enough lightness to allay her sister's fears. Unfortunately, Lydia could see right through her. You're a virgin too, darling, unless you've been keeping something from me. They'll drink your blood too. Eleanor didn't even flinch. They won't be drinking anyone's blood. They thrive on scandal and secrecy, but I suspect they're not nearly as dangerous as they pretend to be, she said in a matter-of-fact voice. They murder babies, Nanny contributed helpfully. Hush, Eleanor said. I'm hardly a baby. Jacobs will take me to the house of the Comte de Giverny, and we will extract our mother and be back before midnight. Begging your pardon, miss, but they were heading out of town, Jacob said. I think they've gone to his chateau. Eleanor remained calm. And how far away is that? Not far, miss. An hour out of town if we hurry. Then we'll be back before dawn, she said. Safe and sound and this time we'll tie Mother to the bed when we can't watch her. And how do you intend to get there? Lydia said. Last I heard, we had no coach, nor horses, nor money to rent them. Are you intending to walk? Eleanor shared a knowing glance with Jacobs, who backed out of the room without another word. Jacobs will handle it, she said smoothly. In the meantime... I'm counting on you to make certain Mother's room is clean and ready for her. We'll probably have to use the restraints we had from the time she was raving. It will depend on how much gin she's drunk, and if she's been fed anything else dangerous. I don't want you going there alone. I'll go with her, Nanny said, bless her elderly heart. She was so crippled with the rheumatics that she could hardly walk but she'd fight a dragoon of soldiers for her babies. No, Nanny, she said gently. I need you to look after Lydia. She met Nanny's gaze for a moment, and a world of understanding passed between them. If by any bizarre chance Eleanor didn't come back, Lydia would need someone, and Nanny was their only choice. Nanny nodded her head and Eleanor could see tears shining in her eyes. Don't be ridiculous, you two. I'm not walking into the gates of hell. The Comte de Giverny is just a man who throws decadent parties, not Satan himself, and I'm hardly the type of female to inflame his darker passions. Besides, Jacobs carries a pistol, and he'd shoot the first man who tried to harm me. I'll go in, ask for my mother, and they'll probably be happy enough to get rid of her, so there's nothing to worry about. Except the diamond brooch, Nanny said grimly. If Eleanor had been closer, she would have kicked one of Nanny's painful shins. The old lady had a very gloomy outlook on life, and right then Lydia needed to be hopeful. She didn't need to learn their last hope of rescue had vanished, and if the jewellery was lost... They were well and truly doomed. But right then, she couldn't afford to waste any more time. Apart from the orgiastic goings-on at the Comte de Giverny's notorious house parties, there was high-stakes gaming. The brooch would be gone in a matter of moments, and if anyone were fool enough to extend her mother credit, they'd have to start hiding from a better class of creditors, the aristocracy as well as the greengrocers. She grabbed her threadbare cloak and the rough shawl she wore over it for added warmth, kissed Lydia and Nanny Maud goodbye, trying to appear insouciant and brave. Nanny clung to her like it was a final goodbye, but Lydia simply sat back in a chair and calmly took up her knitting again. It was an act.
She knew just how dangerous Eleanor's task was, and she knew the best thing she could give her sister was not having to worry about her. The sight of her brave, bowed head of blonde curls made Eleanor want to cry. But she didn't have time for crying. Moments later, she was out in the cold night air. Her fingerless gloves, which were more darning than original weave, were pulled on, the shawl over her ordinary brown hair, and she started down the street, determined to ignore the more unsavory denizens of the neighborhood. Jacobs would be at the nearby café, where horses and carriages were stabled. Circumstances had forced them to borrow a carriage once before, when Lady Caroline had proved herself unwelcome at a masked ball, though they'd fortunately been able to replace it in time with no one the wiser. Tonight they might not be near as lucky, but she couldn't afford to think of that. For now all she could concentrate on was getting her mother safely out of the devil's lair. One thing at a time. Jacobs did better than she'd expected. Appearing with a small traveling chaise large enough to hold two females and not much more, she scrambled inside before Jacobs could get down to her sister, and a moment later they were off. It was a cold, moonless night in early February, and if the modest carriage had ever held lap robes, they were long gone. She pulled a shawl from her head and wrapped it around her shoulders, shivering. It would take an hour to reach the Comte's chateau, if she didn't freeze to death before she got there. Still, if she was half frozen, it could only help matters. It would give her something less daunting to concentrate on. She held on to the seat as it swayed back and forth. Jacobs was driving at a dangerous pace, but she had complete faith in his abilities. They would arrive at the chateau in one piece. The rest was up to her. She had no qualms. She knew exactly what she looked like. She was tall, a bit too thin thanks to the state of their larder, with plain brown hair and eyes, and that unfortunate nose. It wasn't that bad, she mused. It was narrow and elegant, and when she was an old lady she would look quite striking. Still, that didn't help when she was young and wanting to be pretty. But she was past all that. If she ran into the wretched Kant, he'd take one look at her dowdy clothes and hair and never even see her. Thankfully, that was the way with most men. She had no doubt she could find her mother in no time at all, spirit her away, and the strange goings-on at the chateau would be a distant memory. If she still believed in God, she would pray. But she'd lost that particular comfort six years ago. Besides, Nanny and Lydia would be praying for them like mad. If there really was a God, he'd certainly listen to the two of them. Lydia was too charming to ignore, and Nanny too fierce. Perhaps it was only Eleanor he paid no attention to. She closed her eyes. The day had been disastrous from beginning to end, with the unlikely hope of a small inheritance being a mere pinprick compared to the far greater disaster of their future prospects having vanished with the succession. For now, she'd hold that knowledge to herself. Nanny Maud and Lydia didn't need the worry. The lawyer, Mr. Mitchum, had suggested she meet with the new heir the stranger who'd have control over her inheritance. But she'd left the office in a fit of temper. She'd have to meet with a distant cousin eventually, and she'd been a fool to storm off. If there was, in fact, even the most pitiful of bequests, she couldn't be proud enough to refuse it. But first, she had to find her mother. 2. Francis Alistair St. Clair Dominic Charles Edward Rohan, Comte de Giverny, Viscount Rohan, Baron of Glencoe, leaned back, letting his long pale fingers gently stroke the carved wooden claws that decorated the massive chair he sat in.
he let his head rest against the velvet cushioning, surveyed his eager guests, and allowed himself a faint smile. The vast supply of tapers lit even the dark corners of the salon, and he could see them all, his so-called friends and acquaintances, practically quivering in anticipation of the revels that stretched in front of them. Three days and nights of the most libertine indulgences, gaming and coupling with anyone agreeable, whore or lordling, male or female, mock satanic rituals to make participants feel truly wicked, calling on a dark force that no more existed than did a loving god, but babbling Latin in front of an inverted cross gave them even more license to indulge themselves. There was opium and brandy and wine and even good Scots whiskey, and by the time the party was done, he expected every drop to be gone, every body to be well-pleasured, every soul drained of any illusion of morality. And he would watch it all indulging when the urge struck him, overseeing it all with veiled interest. He always wondered how far people would go in pursuit of pleasure. He knew his own appetites were extraordinary, and there were times when he needed more than his own pleasure to satisfy him. He needed the wicked delight of others, and his willing acolytes provided it. There were women and men awaiting his word, some dressed in clerical garb, some wearing little at all. He could recognize Lady Adelia dressed in a diaphanous chemise better suited to a dancer half her weight, and her husband would be somewhere among the gentlemen dressed in feminine splendor, their carmined lips pursed in anticipation. He let his gaze drift over them his disciples in the art of sin. And he sat up, tossing back his long, unpowdered hair. My children, he said in the French they all understood, English and French and German emigres who'd come seeking pleasure. Welcome to the revels of the heavenly host. You will partake of each other as you would partake of the holy wafer. You will drink the wine as if it were the blessed blood, and you will take your fill with no one to judge. For the next three nights the paltry rules of society are forfeit. Our motto stands. Do what thou wilt. Do what thou wilt, they intoned with deep seriousness, like novices taking their final vows and he let a faint smile dance around the mouth they all craved. They were so determined in their pursuit of wickedness that it made him laugh. He waved his hand, the layers of Mechlin lace floating. Then go and sin once more, he said, his deep, rich voice echoing in the huge salon. There was a cheer and the great doors to the rest of the chateau were opened. The rebels began, and Francis Rohan leaned back in his chair, wishing he were back in Paris with a glass of brandy and a good book, and no eager sinners seeking his attention. He was bored. He'd witnessed almost every deprivation known to man, participated in a great many of them, and he'd yet to find anything to pierce his interminable ennui. True, he could still find physical pleasure, but it was no more than a brief respite. When he so desired, he would wander through the rooms of the chateau and observe acts prohibited by church and state. He would watch fortunes being won and lost at the turn of a card. He would watch men give in to the most base instincts with no fear of repercussion, and in the end he would return to his opulent chair, and he would try to summon up some interest. One woman had separated herself from the hearty revelers, and she glided toward him, a demi-mask on her face.
her lush body spilling out of the artful gown she wore. It laced in front, and beneath the loosely tied strings he suspected there was nothing but ripe flesh. He would enjoy loosening those strings. Marianne had quite the most spectacular breasts he had ever seen, and she knew the rules. He wasn't fond of kissing, and she would seldom make the mistake of putting her lips anywhere near his face. She would instead use that magnificent mouth elsewhere, and it would while away an hour or so while the more timid of his guests watched. He signaled with his hand, and she approached, a sly smile on her lips, lips devoid of rouge. She knew what he preferred from her. She came up the small dais his idiot followers had built him, and he noted with approval that the lacing went down to the hem, and indeed she was wearing nothing at all underneath. He pulled her onto his lap, gently, and began playing with the laces, loosening them until her milky white breasts spilled out into the cool night air. Her nipples beaded with the chill, and he had the sudden urge to suckle her. Lean back, he said in his bored voice, and she immediately did so, arching over the arm of the chair, presenting herself to him and he moved his head down to let his tongue graze the pebbled mound, when a sudden noise caught his attention, and he sat up, annoyed, drawing Marianne with him. You've got trouble, Francis, Charles Redding said in his rough, lazy voice, and it's early times for you to be sampling the banquet. Marianne turned and smiled at him, cheerier than Rohan felt at that particular moment. What kind of trouble, he said. I'm not in the mood to be seconding duels or even stopping them. If they want to kill each other, then let them go ahead. I have servants to clean up the blood. Not that kind of trouble. I think you'll like this one. I myself find it rather irresistible. It was enough to get his attention. There was very little Charles Redding found entertaining and whatever did had to be unusual, and therefore possibly of interest. Then don't keep me waiting. Bring forth the trouble. One of your footmen has her. Willis was going to send her on her way when I intervened, knowing you'd be entertained. Shall I tell him to bring her in? I should go, Marianne said, attempting to pull her gown together over her breasts. He was having none of it. You should stay, he said in the cool voice. He turned to Charles. A her, is it? An interesting her? I find that hard to believe. But by all means bring her in. If nothing else, we can toss her to the gentlemen and ladies in the green room. Redding was a handsome man. If you could discount the scar that had been slashed down the right side of his face— turning his smile into a twisted grimace. He made a sketchy bow. I am yours to command, my lord. He backed away in a parody of servile humility, and Francis watched as he called out to a servant. Charles Redding was one of his most amusing companions. Charles had as little regard for propriety as he did, but he viewed things with the fierce passion of youth making Francis feel every one of his thirty-nine years. In truth, he felt eighty. He could feel Marianne squirm, trying to reach for her gown, but it was a simple matter to capture her hand in a vice-like grip. He remembered she liked pain, and he deliberately kept his grip gentle but unbreakable. If he was going to enjoy her later in the evening, as he expected he would, he didn't want her becoming too excited too early. She would go spend that energy on someone else, and he did rather like to be first. One of the footmen appeared, with Willis, his servant from a lifetime ago, on the other side of what was undoubtedly female, and undoubtedly not one of the prostitutes imported from the city.
This was going to be entertaining. He leaned back in his chair and gestured them closer, waiting as they approached, waiting as Redding stood in the background, watching him. What have we got here, Willis? he asked in his mildest voice. It was too much to hope for anything truly entertaining, but it might provide a few moments' distraction. She lifted her head, the dowdy creature, and he found himself looking into warm brown eyes filled with such loathing that for a moment he was charmed. Few people ever showed their dislike of him. And who is she? he inquired lazily. Don't tell me. Someone thought dressing a whore as a rag picker would provide added entertainment. Or no, I think perhaps she's supposed to be a young lady fallen on hard times. Or perhaps a shop girl. Though I fail to see how a shop girl could add to our entertainment. Tilt her head up a bit. The footman moved to do his bidding, and the wench snapped at him like a wild bitch. The man made the very grave mistake of hitting her across the mouth, and when she lifted her head, there was blood on her lip. No, Francis said calmly. I don't think she's a whore, Willis. Not with a nose like that. Whores have pretty little snub noses. This young lady has a nose of consequence. Perhaps you should simply send her on her way. She glared at him, the frowsy little creature. Though in fact she wasn't particularly little. She was taller than most women of his acquaintance. She tried to speak, but Willis pushed ahead of her. She says she's looking for her mother, my lord. Francis threw back his head and laughed. She's the daughter of a whore? What will we come to next? My mother's not a whore, she had the temerity to say, and his interest grew. She had a good voice, solid, low-pitched, and undoubtedly from the upper classes of England. He'd been exiled from that land twenty-two years ago, but he'd entertained enough titled visitors to know the difference. It was the same voice he spoke in when he cared to speak English. Then she's not here, he said. The only women here are whores. Even lovely Marianne here. Granted, she's a titled whore, but a whore she most definitely is. He waited, hoping that Marianne might pull away. But she sat still in his lap, her breasts in full view of the interloper. The girl, no, the woman, looked at him. She was past her girlhood, perhaps somewhere in her twenties, and her lips still bled. Release her, Willis, he said lazily, and take the footman in hand. I'm afraid he's going to have to be taught a very harsh lesson. No one is struck in this household unless they find it arousing. I can tell that Miss Lumpkin is not aroused. He could hear the footman's alarmed intake of breath and the fool tried to apologize, tried to explain as Willis hustled him out of the room, another sturdy footman appearing and helping with the disposal of the rubbish. Rohan released Marianne's wrist, and she carelessly pulled her provocative gown together, hiding her treasures. You may leave us, Marianne, he murmured. I find I have better things to do tonight. He paid absolutely no attention as she scrambled away from him. She'd be very angry with him, which might make things more exciting if he decided to avail himself of her later on. At that moment, he was doubting it. The child in the middle of the— Which of us do you think will triumph? he said. She almost mentioned Lydia. Her younger sister would be panicked if she didn't return home. Already she must be half mad with worry. But her younger sister was just the sort of toy these libertines would take and destroy. She needed to make certain they knew nothing about her, and if surviving a night of worry was the price for her sister's safety, then so be it. Never see you again, she said. You're fulfilling my wildest dreams. <laughs>
If those are your wildest dreams, then you need to work on them. Mrs. Clark will be here in a minute. Go get warm. In fact, she was freezing to death. Now that the immediate fear had passed, and there was nothing more she could do to salvage the situation, the warmth seemed to have left her body. Her feet and the too tight shoes were cold and damp, and if she didn't hold herself very still, she'd start shaking. And she bloody well wasn't going to do that in front of the Antichrist. She headed straight for the armchair. It was even more comfortable than it had looked. It seemed to enfold her, and she couldn't suppress the sigh of sheer delight. She looked up, ready to say something disparaging to her host. But he was already gone. 4. Eleanor leaned back against the chair, finally alone, trying to regain her balance as the world whirled about her. She'd been in rooms like this years ago when they'd lived in England. Warm, cosy rooms, with bright fires burning and comfortable, slightly worn furniture. Which didn't make sense. The notorious Francis Rohan was as rich as Croesus, and the ornate glory of the rest of the chateau attested to that. The red damask upholstery on the sofa opposite her had worn patches, and the floor was scuffed. She must have slipped into some sort of dream, and when a stocky woman appeared a few minutes later, Eleanor decided she was simply a manifestation of her deepest longings for the warmth and safety and comfort of a life long past. There you are, dearie, the apparition said. I'm Mrs. Clark, the housekeeper. You look exhausted, and no wonder all this chasing around you've had to do. Mr. Willis says to inform you that your mother has been found, she's perfectly fine, and Mr. Redding has taken her back home. Eleanor struggled to her feet. I need to go with them. They've already left, Derry. We have orders from Master Francis. You're to rest for a while, and then be sent home in the second best carriage. Your mother will be fine. Mr. Redding's a good man for all that he's mixed up with this lot. The woman looked like Nanny Maud's younger sister. Plump, pleasantly rounded, just the kind of woman you might find in English households everywhere. Just not in the household of the King of Hell. But I need... she began. But Mrs. Clark calmly interrupted her. I know you do, dearie, but there's no arguing with his lordship. You just sit back and rest and I promise you all will be well. You're still wearing your cloak. What was that man thinking? It's raining outside and you're all cold and damp. Before Eleanor realized what the housekeeper was doing, Mrs. Clark had managed to strip the cloak and shawl from her, laying the patched garments carefully near the fire. I hadn't planned on staying, she said. My mother... Now don't you go defending him, Mrs. Clark said. He's a sweet boy, but he can be so thoughtless, and your shoes are socked as well. She made a disapproving clucking sound as she bent down to untie Eleanor's two small shoes. But I'm not— Before she could deny defending him, the woman's words sank in. You must be confused, she said, trying to pull her feet away. It was the Comte de Giverny who brought me in here. Exactly. I was the one who brought him up. Came over from England after he was exiled, and I've been looking after him ever since. She pulled off one shoe and set it near the fire, then the other. She must have noticed how worn they were, that they were too small, but she said nothing, treating them like jeweled slippers. She sat back and looked up at Eleanor for a moment, her gaze sharpening. You need some hot tea and something to eat. I'm not going to be here long, Eleanor said, ignoring the fact that she was ready to faint from hunger. Mrs. Clark was as good at ignoring protests as her master. Won't take me but a minute. You just sit there and warm up. <laughs> 
Master Francis's chef is a stuck-up Frenchman, but he does know how to make cinnamon toast and a good strong cup of tea. My girl's bringing it up. Won't take but a moment. Just rest, Miss Harriman. You look like you need it. Indeed she did. She couldn't remember when she'd last had a full night's sleep. Her mother had a tendency to wander. Just a week ago she'd found her two streets away, dressed only in a nightgown, babbling something about being late for a rout. She'd brought her back and slept sitting up on the corner of her bed, just to make certain her mother didn't wander again. If she'd had any sense, she would have tied the woman up. But Lady Caroline made such distressed noises when they did that it was almost worse than the worry. A moment later, Mrs. Clark was back. There was steam rising from the tray she carried, and she could smell the cinnamon and butter from where she sat. There we are, the housekeeper said cheerfully, setting the tray down beside her on a slightly battered table. All nice and cosy, are we? I'm going to find a throw to put over you. That's a nice enough fire, but you look like you've got yourself a chill. She didn't deny it. She was so cold and disoriented that she wanted to weep. What had happened to her? Had he managed to drug her? There were rumors that he and his band of degenerates did that to unsuspecting young women, but the brief glance she'd had of the half-clothed women parading around the chateau told her that he had no need of a plain, over-tall spinster with a nose. A moment later, a thick cashmere robe was tucked around her, at odds with the shabby furniture. You poor thing, Mrs. Clark said. I'm just going to forget about manners and sit down right beside you. You don't look like you've got enough strength left to pour yourself a decent cup of tea. And Master Francis has never been a man who pays much attention to ceremony. You don't look like you do either. She plopped herself down in the chair beside her, pulled the hand-knitted cosy off the earthenware teapot with capable hands. You're looking at the teapot, aren't you? Mrs. Clark said as she proceeded to pour her a cup of tea with lashings of heavy cream and sugar. I brought that from England when I came here. I thought Master Francis would need something to remind him of home. So young he was, poor boy, to have lost his family, his home, his country. Eleanor wasn't going to ask. She'd heard rumours, but the vagaries of the titled émigré population of Paris had never been of particular interest, and even in the best of times her mother seldom talked to her. Indeed, she said in a non-committal voice. Indeed, Mrs. Clark said cheerfully. You don't want to talk about him, and I can understand that. He's a very bad boy, he is. But he has reason. I cannot think of anything that would excuse his... She was going to say licentiousness, but thought better of it. His behavior. No, I suppose not. You're too young to remember. She shook herself. We'll get you warm and fed and taken care of and back home right as rain, she said firmly. It took all Eleanor's self-control to keep her mouth shut. Too young to remember what? What reason might he have for an exile that was far from voluntary? Some scandal? But none of it mattered, she reminded herself. This wasn't her world. You look like the kind of girl who's been drinking her tea black. Mrs. Clark continued, but right now I think you need some sustenance. The housekeeper was right. She'd given up sugar and milk more than a year ago, insisting she preferred her tea undiluted. In fact, she preferred her tea just as Mrs. Clark was making it. But of late, it had become more important to ensure that her sister got enough to eat and drink. Any cream and sugar they could afford went to Lydia. The tea was ambrosia, manna from heaven, milk and honey. The biblical terms danced through her foggy brain. It was so wonderful that she would have happily trampled over her sister's delicate body for it. Let me get you another cover, the housekeeper said, rising from her seat.
I don't know what's come over me. It's just been so long since I've had a proper young English girl to look after that I let my tongue run away with me. Eleanor struggled to be polite. Don't you miss England? Of course I do, child. But I could never abandon Master Francis, not until he gets past this play-acting foolishness and Mary's. I believe the heavenly host has been holding their revels for many years, Eleanor said. That much gossip she'd heard. Perhaps you should give up waiting. Foolishness, Mrs. Clark said firmly. Eat your toast, dearie. I'll be back. The thin slivers of cinnamon toast were wonderful. She tried to eat slowly, but she was so famished she devoured them. She really must be in a dream. In a moment, the King of Hell would come in and chop off her head or something equally bizarre. It would be worth it. She closed her eyes, the teacup still in her hand. It was old, eggshell-thin china with myriad tiny cracks in it. Another anomaly. But for a moment she wasn't going to think about it. She was going to keep her eyes closed and let herself drift into this strange, wonderful, magical world, where everything was safe and familiar, where there were no raving mothers, no sisters in need of protection, no servants who needed to be fed, and most of all, no Francis Rohan. She heard the door open, heard the measured footsteps approaching her. Mrs. Clark must have returned. She felt the teacup being taken from her slack fingers, and she knew she should open her mouth, insist on a carriage and a ride home. Lydia was waiting for her. But right then it was impossible. Two more hours wouldn't make that much difference. She'd sleep for that long and awake refreshed and reasonable, and this magic room would make sense. By the time she got home, her mother would be in a dull, stupefied state, and they wouldn't have to deal with her for a few days at the least. She always slept deeply after one of her sorties, and all Eleanor would have to worry about was what in heaven's name they were going to do next. He took the teacup from her hand and set it down on the small tray. Mrs. Clark was watching him, a suspicious look on her face. She knew him too well. She was the only person who saw him clearly, with all his flaws and vanities and wicked indulgences. Saw him and loved him anyway, like an exasperated parent. In truth, she wasn't that much older than he was. She'd come into service at the age of twelve, and her first task had been the care of the Viscount Rohan's youngest son, Francis. He'd been born a sickly, angry child, prone to noisy displays of temperament, and young Polly Siddons had been saddled with him. But even at age twelve she'd known how to deal with him, and she'd been with him ever since following him to Paris after the debacle of 1745. When her husband died, she'd simply replaced him with a Frenchman, but she was still Mrs. Clark to all and sundry. His lifeline and his conscience. For all that he listened. And what exactly do you think you're doing with this young lady? she demanded. If you brought her here, you know as well as I do that she's not one of your fancy pieces. She has no place here. True enough, he said, and I'll send her home safely untouched. You've been around me long enough to know that I have no interest in innocence, and she's hardly my style, don't you think? I insist on beauty. In the rest of this godforsaken place, yes, but these rooms are different, Master Francis. Here you're more likely to value real worth, and I don't like seeing her here. I do, he thought, surprised. Don't worry, Mrs. Clark, I'll be sending her back to a misbegotten family as soon as she awakens, which looks to be a while. Poor thing was worn out, his housekeeper said.
She needs a rest without you harassing her. I'm not going to harass her, he said. I'm simply going to take a nap myself. She'll probably wake up and start beating me with a fire poker, but I'm willing to take that risk. You can go back to bed. She gave him that doubtful look that always made him feel twelve years old, but then she nodded. You behave yourself, Master Francis. The girl's already got too much to deal with. She doesn't need you complicating things. Trust me, he said airily, heading for the settee opposite his sleeping guest. I only intend to make her life simpler. With a disapproving sniff, Mrs. Clark departed, leaving him alone in the room with the sound of the fire crackling in the fireplace, the lash of rain on the windows, her steady breathing as she slept. He kicked off his elegant shoes. The settee wasn't the most comfortable of beds, but it was long enough to hold his frame, and he couldn't ask for much more. He'd slept on it when he was younger, and it had resided in his father's house in Yorkshire, and he'd always found it surprisingly comfortable. He stretched out, his arms behind his head, and stared at her. He could be kind, he could be generous, if he had reason. He had his reputation to consider, but he doubted anyone would know he'd done an act of charity in seeing to Miss Harriman's mother. If anyone heard... They'd assume he had wicked ulterior motives, and that was good enough for him. This girl before him wasn't a beauty. Her dark brown hair was unremarkable. Her body, what he could see of it beneath the shabby clothes, could hardly compete with Mary Ann's lush pleasures. The pleasures he'd turned his back on to lie on this shabby sofa staring at this shabby girl. Her face was interesting. She had a smattering of freckles across her cheekbones, something he'd always found irresistible. A surprisingly lush mouth, which clearly hadn't been kissed enough. And the nose. It was narrow and elegant, and only slightly longer than beauty required. In fact, it gave her face a certain piquant charm. Without it, with the requisite button of a nose, she'd be boring. Boring was the one thing Miss Eleanor Harriman couldn't lay claim to. She'd stormed into his life, and she was still here, long after she should have disappeared. He could have handed her off to Reading. She would have much preferred accompanying her mother's drunken body back to Paris, but he'd kept her here instead. She was better off this way. Lady Caroline had proven combative, and he'd sent two strong footmen to keep her contained in his travelling carriage with Reading to oversee the transfer. No, this stern young woman would be better off arriving home after her mother was properly settled. He'd given Redding orders to make certain one of the footmen remained until they were convinced Lady Caroline had returned to her senses. Which was no certainty. He'd been watching when they'd wrestled the woman into the carriage, her curses and her fists flying. The pox had driven her mad, and nothing would change that. The sooner she died, the better for all concerned. He could arrange it, of course. As he lounged on the settee, he considered the possibilities. The wretched hag would have little connection with him, and there'd be no reason for him to be accused of orchestrating her death. Any of the heavenly host who happened to have noticed her presence here tonight would never breathe a word of it or risk being ousted from their hallowed little group. The police in Paris were fairly lax, but they might pay more attention to the death of a titled émigré. Then again, they might not. They let him do anything he wanted in his mansion in Rue Saint-Honoré, but then no one had died. At least as far as he knew. No, his charitable instincts would be better off curbed for the time being. Wretched as Mademoiselle Eleanor Harriman's life might be, it was hardly his job to fix it. <laughs>
to remove the major obstacle to her happiness. Though the poxy wretch might annoy Redding so much that he stabbed her. Redding was notoriously quick-tempered, rash and impulsive. Perhaps he'd take care of things of his own volition. In the meantime, here he was, ready to sleep with the perfect virgin. He let out a soft laugh. Miss Harriman would hate that, making it all the more delightful. They would sleep together, albeit a chaste three feet apart, and it would annoy her for the rest of her life. And with that, he closed his eyes and slept, a smile on his face, malice in his heart. He slept. It was past five in the morning and Lydia Harriman was already up and dressed, having spent a wretched three hours in bed, tossing and turning before giving up completely. Her mother's disappearance wasn't that unusual. Lady Caroline would vanish for days at a time, and there was nothing they could do about it. But she'd gotten much worse recently. Her conversations were sprinkled with curses, and there was a strange, otherworldly look in her eyes that no one could break through. She complained constantly of the cold, even with the warmest fire, and when things were really bad they tied her to the bed lest she hurt herself. Or them. When her mother was raging, there was no telling what she might do, and Nanny Maud kept the knives hidden just to be safe. And there were times which Lydia would never admit to, that she hoped her mother would simply not return from her next escapade. But this time Eleanor had disappeared as well. It was an eerie, ice-cold dawn. She'd been careful not to put too much wood on the fire. What little fuel they had must last as long as possible. Eleanor tried to shield her from the harsher realities of life, and Lydia had stopped arguing. If it made her elder sister happy to think that she was ignorant of the truly desperate circumstances they were living in, then Lydia could pretend. Eleanor had always been a bossy sibling, in the best sense of the word, and she wouldn't hear of Lydia shouldering her share of the burden. Sooner or later, she'd have to give in. But for now... Eleanor was happier pretending that she had everything under control when control had vanished months ago. She heard the noise in the kitchen, and she jumped up, almost knocking over the chair in her relief. Nanny was already there, in her robe and nightcap, as Jacobs came in. Alone. Where are the others, you old idiot? Nanny Maud demanded before Lydia could speak. The old man hung his head. We followed her ladyship out of the city to the devil's own playground. He turned to Lydia. There was no stopping your sister, miss. She took off before I knew what she was doing, and they wouldn't let me follow her. I tried to fight them, but there were too many of them, and I'm an old man, not as strong as I was. You couldn't have done anything, Lydia said in a soothing voice while Nanny made a derisive noise that could almost be called a snort. They wouldn't have been stopping me, the old woman said bitterly. You're a fool and a coward. You crazy old bat, no one would dare to touch a Herod and the likes of you, he snapped back, their lifelong battle flaring up. Stop it, both of you, Lydia said sharply. You still haven't told me where they are. Did they go to that man's chateau? They did indeed, he said. Your mother had gone there to gamble. I hadn't been there an hour, still trying to find my way into the house, when they came and found me, told me to take the coach and get back to town, and your mother and sister would be following. What coach? If Jacobs had been looking shamefaced before, he looked even more devastated now. The coach, uh, I meant to say, uh, the coach, uh, he cleared his throat. I had to borrow a coach. You had to steal a coach, Lydia interrupted him gently. 
That's all right, Jacobs. I'm not as blind as my sister wishes me to be. You've done it before, I know. So you stole a coach in order to go after my mother. Well done. Did you get it back before anyone noticed it was missing this time? Jacobs lifted his head, clearly relieved. Not quite, Miss Lydia, but I managed to sneak away before they caught me, and they're not going to make too big a fuss since everything's been returned. Everything but my mother and my sister, Lydia said. The Viscount's men promised they'd be coming home in a fancy coach, he said desperately. I never would have left if I didn't think they'd be better off with his lordship. The man everyone calls the devil? The one who runs satanic parties and drinks the blood of virgins? Lydia said, trying not to sound panicked. You need to steal another coach, Jacobs. I have to go after her. Miss, it's daylight. I cannot steal a coach in broad daylight. Then I'll walk, she said fiercely. I'm not going to sit by and let my family be. The noise at the front door interrupted her, and she turned around and flew down the hall, flinging open the door with relief. Oh, Nell, I was so worried about you. Her voice trailed off as she realized she was looking at someone a far cry from her sister. He stood in the doorway, silhouetted by the sunrise over the rickety buildings, and she couldn't see his face even though he doubtless could see hers quite clearly. Not Nell, I'm afraid. He had a deep English voice, and for a moment Lydia was flooded with a host of memories of a life lost long ago. I assume you're her sister. I have your mother in the coach. If you'll show me where I can have my men bring her, I'd be greatly obliged. Yes, of course. It took her a moment to gather her wits. In the front bedroom. She could hear the howls and curses coming from behind the stranger, and her heart sank. Her mother was in one of her full-blown bouts of madness, and Eleanor wasn't around. She was better at calming Lady Caroline than any of them. We'll have to see about restraints. I'm not sure where anything is. You needn't be concerned, Miss Harriman, he said smoothly. My men can handle things. He turned and made a gesture behind him, and for a moment she could see his face. It was a handsome face, or it would have been, if not for the scar running from eyebrow to mouth on one side, giving him a faintly sinister look, quirking his lips up in a parody of a smile. He was dressed exquisitely and he doffed his hat to expose unpowdered tawny hair. For a moment she couldn't move. This must be the devil they talked about, and for the first time she could understand the lure. Miss Harriman, he said gently, and she shook herself out of her abstraction. You're very kind, she said, racking her brains for his title. All the ones she could remember were vastly insulting. She backed out of the way, and he followed her into the shabby little house, and she mentally thanked God she was already up and dressed. Nanny was bustling around, clucking like an agitated hen, clutching her robe around her plump frame. He took her arm with the finesse of a prince. Why don't we get out of their way and leave them to take care of things? Your housekeeper can show the footman where to put her. That's Nanny Maud! she blurted out as he drew her into the tiny front room with its sullen excuse for a fire. It was a ridiculous thing to say, but she didn't want Nanny relegated to the role of servant when she was so much more. He smiled, the move jerking his smile up so that he looked even more ruthless. Nanny's got things well in hand, he said smoothly, and I've been remiss. I haven't introduced myself. I know who you are, my lord, she said. Finally his name came to her. You're the Comte de Giverny. She was determined not to show any fear. Apparently you consort with the devil, have orgies, and drink the blood of virgins. According to gossip, you're sin itself. The smile, 
which had been oddly pleasant and even comforting despite the scar, turned cool. Sorry to disappoint you, Miss Harriman. I realize I look like the very devil, but in fact I'm nothing more than an untitled gentleman with an ugly face and empty pockets. Charles Redding at your service. She could feel the color flood her face. You're not the Demon King? I'm afraid not. He shook his head. No. He's busy entertaining your sister. Five. For a moment, Lydia didn't move. You're not ugly, she said. Before he could respond to that, she went on. And what's the cont doing with my sister? I presume the stories are just that, stories made up to scare children into behaving. Do they work? Are you properly terrified? I left my childhood behind years ago, Mr. Redding. At that moment, they were interrupted by the procession of people carrying her mother into the house. She was struggling, swearing, and spitting, her waif-thin body unnaturally strong, and one of the men carrying her cursed when she managed to land a blow. A moment later, they disappeared into the bedroom, Nanny Maud following them and closing the door behind her. She turned to look back at Redding. He had dark eyes and he was watching her with curiosity and no pity whatsoever. How long has your mother had the pox? I don't know, she said, unable to pull her gaze away from him. For a penniless gentleman he was quite elegant, from his high cheekbones to the glossy boots he wore. The left side of his face had an almost unearthly beauty. The scar on the right had healed badly, turning that beauty into a travesty. A duel, he said. She blinked. I beg your pardon? You're wondering what caused the scar. Don't be embarrassed. It's what everyone thinks when they see me. I'm not embarrassed, because, in fact, I wasn't thinking about that at all. I was worried about my sister. I stand humbled and corrected, though in fact I'd prefer not to stand. I had no intention of riding in the coach with your mother, casting up her accounts all over the place, so I rode and I'm quite tired. However, I can't sit down until you invite me to do so and sit down yourself, and since you don't seem about to, I thought I might offer a little hint. Please sit, she said, rattled taking the small hard chair and leaving the more comfortable one near the fire for him. He shook his head. Not likely. Change seats and I will. I'm fine where I am. Before she realized what he was doing, he tossed his hat onto the small table, clamped his gloved hands on her arms and lifted her, dropping her into the seat by the fire as if she weighed no more than a bird. He must have thought as much. He frowned. Have you been eating properly? She thought about the thin soup Nanny had managed to stretch for the week with the careful addition of more and more water, and her stomach knotted. Of course, she said. Because you don't weigh more than a child. How many children are you in the habit of picking up, Mr. Redding? She responded. Oh, I forgot. The devil sacrifices babies, does he not? He doesn't. He stopped protesting. You're teasing me, are you, Miss Harriman? Just a little bit, she allowed. I shouldn't. Things are hardly humorous right now. But since I've seen the difference between gossip and reality firsthand, I have little doubt that the Comte de Giverny is nothing more than a self-indulgent hedonist. He took the seat across from her, and she held her breath. Afraid it might not hold his firmly muscled weight. It creaked, but survived, at least for the moment. As is his best friend, he said, his voice less than reassuring. Really? she said, her voice bright. I've never seen a self-indulgent hedonist before. <laughs>
I have to say I'm a bit disappointed. You don't look very dissipated to me. Maybe you haven't been at it for a terribly long time. Long enough, he said beneath his breath. There wasn't much she could say to that. Could you tell me where my sister is? Why didn't she return with you? Again, there's the problem of the carriage. Oh dear, I forgot. Your poor carriage. We can't afford to have it cleaned, but Jacobs and I can see to it. It's not my carriage. And Rohan has more than enough servants to deal with it. More than enough carriages, for that matter. Rohan? she echoed. The King of Hell. The Comte de Giverny. The Viscount Rohan, he clarified. The man who has my sister. He'll return her safe and unharmed. Francis doesn't waste time with innocence. Unless your sister's shabby clothes and stern manner hide a lurid background. It shouldn't have bothered her, but she pulled her shawl closer around her shoulders, hiding some of her own shabbiness. Her only clothes were those passed down from Eleanor, one stage closer to the rag bag, something this exquisitely attired gentleman had no doubt noted and inwardly mocked. I'm afraid we're living in straitened circumstances, Mr. Redding, she said, lifting her head. We're awaiting word from our father, who will doubtless come to our aid, but in the meantime there is no denying that our fortunes have suffered of late. He said nothing more than, Indeed. I get the uneasy suspicion that you're holding something back, Mr. Redding, she said. Or were you simply going to cast more aspersions on my threadbare wardrobe? I'm afraid you're so pretty that I hadn't even noticed your wardrobe, Miss Harriman. Your sister doesn't have the advantage of your beauty. If that's supposed to make me feel better, it's failed, she said, finally getting angry. My sister is very striking, and only shallow gentlemen would fail to realize that. I'm very shallow, Miss Harriman. You enchant me. Your sister terrifies me. Good, she said, then realized how it sounded. I mean good that my sister terrifies you, and I would certainly wish that I could do the same. He looked at her. In fact, you do terrify me, Miss Harriman, for quite different reasons. I can't imagine why. His twisted smile was far from reassuring. I think you would prefer I not mention it to you, he murmured. I don't understand. You don't need to. I believe I should make certain your mother is settled. He rose, and he suddenly seemed a great deal more alarming. He took her hand, so small in his large one, and pulled her to her feet with such strength that she practically flew into his arms, only her presence of mind and his quick thinking preventing such an absolute disaster. He lifted her hand to his mouth, that twisted, scarred mouth, and kissed it, leaving her to stare after him, momentarily distracted. Eleanor awoke in a dimly lit room, deliciously warm, for what seemed like the first time in years. Her stomach was pleasantly full, her feet didn't pinch, and for a few brief moments she felt almost peaceful. And then she opened her eyes and saw a man sleeping on the sofa across from her, and not just any man, King Rohan himself. Her quick intake of horrified breath was almost silent, but he opened one eye anyway, looking at her. Yes. You slept with the devil, Miss Harriman, he drawled, and lived to tell the tale. She sat up, shoving down the cover that someone had thoughtfully draped over her, then realized her shawl was gone as well, and during her sleep the threadbare bodice of her ancient dress had shredded just a little bit more, exposing too much of her chest. She needed a fichu as well as her shawl, but woven cloth was a scarcity, and she'd thought the shawl would give her modest coverage. She was wrong.
She started to yank the cover back up, but he was closer than she realized, and his indolent pose was clearly just that, a pose. He caught the blanket before she could cover herself, tossing it to one side. There's no need to be excessively modest, Miss Harriman. You still err on the side of decency. My shawl, she said in a strangled voice. It's over on the chair. He glanced that way. Is it? And why would you assume I'd be interested in waiting on you? Particularly when I don't wish to have you cover up your surprisingly delightful charms. She started to get up, feeling desperate, and he simply pushed her back in the chair again. All right, if you're going to be tiresome, he said, moving over to her discarded clothing and fetching her thin shawl. She could see the light through it but it was better coverage than what she was wearing, and she snatched it from his hand, wrapping it around her shoulders and waist so that it stayed firmly in place. That's better, she said, breathing a sigh of relief. Terrible. And it doesn't change the fact that you spent the night sleeping with me. Don't be ridiculous. I had no idea you were there and I'm not quite certain why you chose to fall asleep on such an uncomfortable piece of furniture. You're in the midst of hosting an orgy. Shouldn't you have been frolicking with courtesans? It's a three-day revel, child. I seldom frolic until the second night. And besides, I've already frolicked with any of my guests who interest me. You're a novelty. A novelty who shall remove herself forthwith she said. I cannot believe I let myself fall asleep in such circumstances. Where is my mother? Back home. I had Redding see to her, and since he has yet to return, I'm assuming he's had a bit of difficulty. The poor man with the scar? Rohan laughed softly. Oh, he would be so distressed to hear you call him that. He thinks his scar makes him a very dangerous character. So, Tell me, Miss Harriman, what will he find when he arrives at your home, besides your hapless, larcenous coachman? No one. Lydia was much better at opening her eyes wide and looking innocent, but Eleanor gave it her best try. Don't attempt to play games with me, he said lazily. He strolled over to the window, looking out onto the early morning landscape. I'm a master at them. Who else resides in your household besides you and your mother? My old nanny. And who else? No one. He turned his head. You're not an adept liar, Miss Harriman. If I remember correctly, Lady Caroline Harriman had two daughters. My sister died. A faint smile touched his mouth. If you're going to continue lying, you really need to do a better job of it, my pet. I'm certain I could find someone to teach you the fine points. It's a useful skill. I'm not lying. She glanced toward the door. If she caught him off guard, she could make her escape, and if she couldn't find a carriage or a horse, she could simply walk the five miles to Paris. Except that her tattered shoes were nowhere to be seen. Don't be tiresome, Rohan said. You have a very pretty little sister, do you not? She wasn't going to show her terror. She'd always known she'd be safe enough. She hadn't the face to drive men to distraction, and a determined libertine such as Rohan would have beauty at his fingertips. But her baby sister was a different matter. She'd already done everything she could to keep her safe, and she had nothing left to barter. Except rage. If you or anyone touches my sister, I'll kill you, she said in a cold, determined voice. He flashed her his exquisite smile. Now that was said with real conviction. Your sister must be quite extraordinarily pretty. My sister is none of your business. She quickly came up with a more believable lie. 
As soon as my father arranges it, we'll return to England and she'll be happily married. You expect your father to arrange a marriage for her? he asked, leaning against the wall of the study. He still wore his long silken waistcoat, unbuttoned, and during the night his white shirt had opened even more, exposing his chest. Women weren't meant to see men's bare chests, and for the first time she could understand why. There was something deliberately enticing about that expanse of flesh, and it could lead a girl to sinful thoughts. Not that she was a girl, and she was impervious to sinful thoughts. She won't have an arranged marriage, she snapped. I intend to make certain she marries for love. His look of astonishment wasn't feigned. My dear child, he said softly, you cannot tell me you still believe in the existence of love. Not after the life you've been forced to live. My life has been just fine, she said coolly, and I'm not thinking for myself, but for Lydia, absolutely. It's no less than she deserves. And why don't you deserve it? She didn't flush. She'd trained herself not to show any reaction, and she was a far better liar than he gave her credit for. I have no interest in it. Lydia's a different matter. As soon as our father— You know as well as I do that your father is dead. The new Baron Tolliver is in town, looking to make your acquaintance. She kept her expression calm, her hands gripping her skirts out of sight. How do you know that? I am kept abreast of everything that goes on in emigre society, Poppet. Lord Jasper Harriman died of an apoplexy several months ago, and the heir who has taken his place is now in Paris. He's yet to make my acquaintance, though I assure you that time will come if he stays here long enough. I doubt there's any rescue coming from that direction. She wasn't going to let him get to her. Then Lydia will simply have to marry a handsome, kind, wealthy Frenchman, she said calmly. He moved away. And what will happen to you and your mother? If your sister is as pretty as I suspect she is, from your fiercely protective mien, then a good marriage isn't out of the question. A deranged belle mère and a sister-in-law are less appealing. She flushed, knowing he spoke nothing but the truth. We both know that my mother won't live for much longer, she said. As for me, I am perfectly capable of being independent. I can become a governess. I can teach English and the piano fort. Or I could obtain a position as companion to an older lady. Not once she discovers you spent the night with me. She rose. Huddling in the chair was a sign of weakness. And standing, he still towered over her not inconsiderable height. But sitting gave him an even greater advantage. There's no reason that would happen. You have nothing to gain by spreading such vile rumors. They aren't rumors, my pet. It's the simple truth. As for what I have to gain, I'm afraid you put far too low a price on your charms. I've told you. You're a rarity in these parts, and I find myself reluctantly fascinated. Listen to your reluctance, she said briskly. I'm not worth the trouble. And charming though this conversation is, I need to get home and see to my mother. But what if I don't want to let you go? You can hardly walk all the way back to the city, and you continue to fascinate me. He flicked an imaginary speck off the snowy white shirt he wore. He moved closer, and she moved back, surreptitiously, putting the chair between them with a casual air. Not that she seriously distrusted him. This was a game he was playing, nothing more, like a great hungry tomcat playing with a little white mouse, or so he thought. I've walked more than five miles before, I can do it now. In bare feet, he said pointedly. She immediately crouched so that her threadbare skirts covered her feet. Now that distresses me, he said. You have quite lovely feet.
Most women have fat little toes and broad feet. And dancers, God help me, they have the ugliest feet of all. But you really have exquisite. I would appreciate it if you would stop rhapsodizing over my anatomy and summon a carriage, she said, mortified. He might well have been talking about her breasts, and she wondered what else he'd been observing in such a familiar manner. Your hands, he said, startling her. You're quite ridiculously easy to read. You were wondering what I was going to go on about next. I'm quite fascinated by your hands. She immediately tucked her hands into a shawl, but he wasn't deterred. They don't look particularly soft. Not the plump, white, useless hands most women have. You have long, beautiful fingers, narrow palms, and yet there's strength in those hands. I rather think I want to feel them on my body. She let out a hiss of breath, ridiculously, undeniably shocked. So shocked, she forgot to move as he came closer. Dangerously closer. Don't look so horrified, sweeting. Surely you didn't mistake my interest in you as any humanitarian behavior on my part. I don't give a damn if your mother dies, and I don't let myself be distracted from my activities unless there's something I want more. That would be you. She stared at him. And how long have you suffered this disorder of the brain, my lord? And how long have you disregarded your worth, Miss Harriman? He replied. Six years, she could have told him, but she didn't. That time was over, long forgotten, and she didn't have to think about it. He was playing a game with her. He'd already admitted he was very good at games, and she'd seen the women who surrounded him. If you will please summon your housekeeper, I have no doubt she'll be able to retrieve my shoes and then I'll be on my way. Her manner was brisk and practical, the perfect counterpoint to his absurdly seductive manner. To prove her point, she rose to a full height again, exposing her bare feet. Miss Harriman, are you possibly so unwise as to call my bluff? He asked, his voice silken. Certainly not, Monsieur le Comte. I simply choose not to play this little game of yours. There was a bell pull by the door, and she crossed the room and yanked it. She half expected him to come after her, to catch her hand as she reached for the bell pull, to pull her into his arms tight against his body as he had last night. He took one step toward her, and then halted, his self-deprecating smile back in place as he dropped back down on the settee. So be it. He waved one pale hand in her direction. Mrs. Clark will see you to the carriage. The door opened as he spoke. Mrs. Clark will do no such thing, that lady pronounced. You will get up and take this young woman home like the gentleman you once were. Eleanor expected to see him explode. Instead, he merely leaned back with a sigh of acquiescence. Call me when the carriage is ready. This is no way to entertain a young lady, Master Francis, Mrs. Clark said in a scolding voice. Then remove her, he said in a bored voice. Master Francis? Mrs. Clark's comfortable Scots voice held a note of warning, and he opened his eyes again. Why I ever brought you with me to France is a matter beyond my comprehension, he said wearily, sitting back up. You didn't bring me. We followed you against your express orders, which should make it clear that I'm going to do what I think is right, at least in my part of the house, and anyone you bring here will have to be treated respectfully. Yes, Mrs. Clark, he said in a mockingly subdued voice. You will allow me to change before I escort the young lady home, won't you? I have standards I need to uphold, and for that matter, she seems to be in need of shoes. I have them with me, sir, Mrs. Clark said, perfectly obsequious now that she'd gotten her way. Go ahead and change. We'll be waiting for you. <laughs>
We? If you're going, then there's no need for me. I'm not going, Master Francis. You know I have a grave aversion to Paris. I'll merely be keeping the young lady company until you change your clothes. And it would behoove you to hurry. The longer we're together, the more things I could tell her. She expected Rohan to look more than a little disgruntled, but he simply laughed. I doubt anything you tell her would surprise her. She already knows I'm a total wastrel. If you take too long, I'll be telling her all the good things I know of you. Good God, he said in tones of absolute horror. I'll be quick as the devil. He'd reached the door, then stopped for a moment, looking back at Eleanor, staring at her. Master Francis, Mrs. Clark said in a warning tone. I just wanted to take a last glance at her exquisite feet before you covered them up again. It might be a while before I see them again. It will be never, Eleanor said, crossing her arms over her chest. Don't count on it, my pet. Whatever scurrilous lies Mrs. Clark spreads about my so-called goodness, she'll have to admit that I always get what I want. And before she could say another word, he vanished, closing the door quietly behind him. Six. There's really no need for him to accompany me, Eleanor said hurriedly, suddenly able to breathe again. In fact, I'd be much more comfortable travelling back to Paris alone. If you could just help me find my shoes and direct me to the carriage, you could tell his lordship that his assistance was not needed. Don't you worry, Miss Harriman, Mrs. Clark said briskly. He'll behave himself. And I've got my girl Janet finding some nice warm boots for you. The ones you wore have fallen apart and there's snow in the air. Find some boots for me. On a less dignified personage, Mrs. Clark's smile would have looked positively mischievous. Lady Carleton looks to be about your size. Whenever she comes, she brings several trunks of clothing and shoes, which seems ridiculous, because according to Janet, she spends the entire time wearing nothing at all. She'll never notice if one of her pairs of boots has gone missing. I can't wear stolen boots, Eleanor said, scandalized. Of course you can. The door opened, and Janet appeared, bearing a tea tray with a pair of kid leather boots under her arm. She looked like a younger version of Mrs. Clark, and she set both her offerings in front of Eleanor. There were toast strips on the tray as well as tea, and a pair of silk stockings with the boots, and Eleanor gave up being virtuous. No disasters, pet. Mrs. Clark inquired of Janet. They're all sleeping it off, most of them starkers, Janet said. No worries. I never do, her mother said. Drink your tea, Miss Harriman. The doings of this household, while shocking, needn't concern you any more than they concern me. They don't concern you, Eleanor said with a mouthful of toast. I never venture into that part of the chateau. His lordship likes to misbehave, but as long as no one is hurt, I keep out of it. This part of the house is small but cosy, with no strumpets allowed. You don't think I could be a strumpet? She poured her tea and put obscene amounts of sugar in the cup. She might as well enjoy it while it lasted. I suppose it's the nose she said resignedly. The nose, Mrs. Clark said, her forehead wrinkling. You mean your nose? What's wrong with it? It's the Harriman nose, she said gloomily. Strumpets are pretty. Strumpets are tarts. As for your nose, it's nothing that extraordinary. It gives your face character, something those foolish girls lack. Lucky me, Eleanor murmured. She took another toast sliver, then jumped as she realized Janet had knelt before her and reached for one bare foot. I'll take care of this, miss, Janet said. My mother wants me to train as a lady's maid. <laughs>
Unfortunately, there are never any ladies at his lordship's house parties, Mrs. Clark said grimly. And Master Francis should be returning momentarily. You wouldn't want to be flaunting your bare feet in front of him now, would you? Trapped. Thank you, Janet, she said. You're very kind to help me. It was almost seductive. The warm, sweet, rich tea, the toast livers with lashings of butter and a sprinkle of cinnamon sugar, a maid assisting with her clothes. It had been so long since they'd had a lady's maid that she could barely remember what it was like. Janet drew the silk stocking up her leg for her, and the feeling was decadently wonderful. Too splendid to fight. Besides, she could give the stockings to Lydia, who'd delight in the extravagance. She'd have to somehow convince her younger sister that she herself couldn't wear them. Lydia had grown suspicious of Eleanor's stratagems. Her sudden dislike of sugar, her inability to drink cream, the discomfort of the one decent pair of boots between them. She'd be hard put to come up with the reason why Lydia simply must accept the silk stockings as her own, but she could prevaricate with the best of them. She'd had her mother as an example. The boots were a perfect fit, roomy for her less than dainty feet. By the time she'd finished her tea and toast and had the kid leather boots neatly fastened, she felt she could face any kind of ogre including the one who'd reappeared in the door of the cosy drawing-room, looking enigmatic. I've had the carriage brought round, he said. Where's your cloak? Here it is, sir, Janet said, reappearing from behind him, carrying a fur pelisse, the sort of thing that was shockingly expensive and deliciously warm. Eleanor set the tray away and rose, speechless for the moment. Janet came up behind her to assist her into the pilfered cloak, and Eleanor whispered a protest to the maid. I can't take this. There you go, Miss Harriman, Janet said in a loud voice, taking one of Eleanor's arms and shoving it into the sleeve. She could either have a wrestling match with the maid, something she might very likely lose, or give in. She was taller than the sturdy Janet, but Janet was very strong. Are you two going to fight? The King of Hell asked in a lazy tone. There are few things more entertaining than watching two females try to tear each other apart, but if you're going to go at it, you might give me some time to get my own tea and perhaps find a better venue. Eleanor stopped struggling, and the cloak slid up her arms. Janet stepped behind her and began fastening it and it took all of Eleanor's self-control not to bat at her hands. Stolen boots and silk stockings were one thing, a rich fur cloak quite another. But the garment was so blessedly warm. No catfights. I'm shattered. But then I've learned to live with disappointment. Come along then, Miss Harriman. The sooner I leave you in Paris, the sooner I can get back to vigorous dissipation, since you seem determined to resist my blandishments, and frolicking with my guests. Or was it trifling? As long as you don't frolic with Miss Harriman, Mrs. Clark said sternly. She turned to Eleanor. Goodbye, miss. I look forward to seeing you again. That was most certainly not going to happen. Eleanor thought, thanking the woman. Rohan held out his arm, and she hesitated for a moment. He simply took her hand and pulled her to his side, ungently. You must at least pretend to be on speaking terms with me, Miss Harriman, he drawled. Why? He simply glanced down at her. It was an unnerving experience. She was so very much taller than most of the men, particularly the French ones, that having to look up into those hard, merciless blue eyes only added to the sense of unreality. But if she didn't want to wrestle with Janet for fear she might lose, fighting with Lord Rohan would be even worse, because she knew he wouldn't be following any of the rules of civilized behavior. 
There was a light snow falling when they stepped outside the massive front portico of the chateau, and Eleanor drew the stolen fur cloak closer around her, trying to ignore her guilt. The liveried footman immediately opened the coach door for her, and she pulled away from Rohan and scrambled up before he could assist her. He'd barely touched her, but she didn't trust those large, beautiful hands. A moment later, he was inside as well, dwarfing the spacious interior, and they were on their way. It had been so very long since she'd been in such an elegant coach. Perhaps never. Her father had been wealthy, but not on the scale of Rohan, and he had never sent his young daughters out in his best carriage. She tucked her hands in the folds of the police, lifting her eyes to look at her reluctant companion. Stretched out on the seat, perfectly comfortable, he was eyeing her with calm curiosity. You should have had Mrs. Clark steal you some warm gloves and a bonnet while she was at it, he said. Lady Carlton would never miss them. She'd been warm enough before, but the heat that flushed her face was uncomfortable, and she immediately reached up to unfasten the cloak. One look at his face stopped her. You really don't want to get into a wrestling match with me now, do you, my sweet? His voice was amused. I'd like nothing more than an excuse to put my hands on you in the privacy of the carriage. It's a long, cold drive into Paris, and I can think of any number of things that would make the time pass more quickly, all of which involve touching you. Lady Carlton has a dozen fur cloaks, and your shabby cloak was probably infested with vermin. It was not, she said, incensed. If you say so. His eyes narrowed, and he yawned. I assume you aren't interested in, uh, frolicking with me? No. Trifling? We've already been flirting. We have not, she said aghast. Oh, yes, child. We most certainly have, even if you don't recognize it. Why don't we simply dispense with all the pleasantries and descend into hot, nasty fornication? For perhaps the first time in her life, Eleanor was at a loss for words. And in the end, only the most foolish ones escaped her mouth. In a carriage? He laughed. Oh, most definitely in a carriage. Though if you prefer a bed... We can always return to the chateau, though we'd have to avoid Mrs. Clark's evil eye. His words were shocking, disturbing. No doubt meant to be, she realized. He had no more amatory interest in her than he had in Mrs. Clark. But if she charged him with it, he doubtless strived to prove her wrong. She managed to meet his dark, wicked gaze with a deceptive calm. You promised her you'd behave with propriety. Such promises, had I made them, would have been hollow. But in fact, I did no such thing. Mrs. Clark has known me for decades, Miss Harriman. She has no illusions about my true nature. She simply never gives up hope. His eyes narrowed. Are you really so inured to temptation? I've managed to seduce nuns and sapphists, and I'm unused to having my attempts ignored. Curiosity got the better of her. Sapphists? Women who prefer the love of other women, child. Her brow wrinkled. How? Allow me to explain. He moved to her side of the carriage before she realized what he was doing. She tried to leap to the other side, but he managed to catch hold of her, one arm tight around her waist, keeping her beside him. She glared up at him. You seem to have spent a great deal of time mishandling me, my lord, and I don't like it. Take your hands off me. Then don't fight me. I'm just trying to improve your education. He took one of her hands in his gloved one. It was pathetic. Small and rough beneath the patched fingerless glove. He stripped it off and sent it sailing to the other side of the coach, 
I'm surprised that Mrs. Clark didn't come racing after us with a pair of gloves for you. It wasn't my idea. Of course it wasn't my pet, he said soothingly. Mrs. Clark is a hard woman to argue with. No, just settle back, and I will proceed with your education. I don't— Hush, he said softly, putting one gloved fingertip up against her mouth. This isn't going to hurt. The soft leather that shielded his flesh from hers should have made his touch less intimate. Unfortunately, everything he did and said was intimate. He held her hand in his, his thumb rubbing against the center of her palm. It had a curiously calming effect. Now, I assume you understand the mechanics of male and female coupling. Most properly brought up young virgins would be totally ignorant, but your upbringing leaves much to be desired. You know what men and women do, and how their parts fit together with such splendid neatness. She wouldn't have called it that, she thought, biting her lip. Of course, she said in a cold voice. She didn't bother trying to pull her hand away. It would have been a waste of energy. He was so much stronger than she was, and she couldn't believe he intended to hurt her. Women, of course, are unequipped with the necessary equipment to complete the act of love. So they employ alternatives. Some use equipment they can strap on that makes them appear masculine. Eleanor squirmed on the seat. Others use their mouths, as men and women do with each other. I imagine you've seen something of that, living as you have. Yes, she said in a strangled voice. But the simplest thing, particularly in a semi-public occasion, is to use their hands upon each other. He was still stroking her palm, and then his fingers moved up, carefully curling all but her two middle fingers down. You know about this, don't you, my pet? How to pleasure yourself? She didn't, couldn't say a word. The thought of willingly engaging in anything that resembled coupling, even on one's own, seemed the height of madness. No, he whispered moving her hand down. This is how it's done. And he put her hand between her legs. She fought him then, shocked, but her efforts made her legs part, and he moved her hand closer to the center of her, holding her fingers steady. You touch, he whispered, just lightly at first, delicately, like a butterfly. Pleasure can't be forced, it must be coaxed. He pushed her hand a little farther into her skirts, so that her fingertips touched that center core of herself, and she felt an odd shiver of reaction, one that frightened her. Please, don't, she protested. But he simply ignored her. Now, my love, you mustn't be shy, he whispered in admonishment. If you knew how to do this by yourself, I'd leave you alone. Trust me, you'll thank me once you master the trick of it. It makes many a long night more engaging, and it will help if you decide to turn to women for comfort. He pushed her hand again, so that it rubbed between her legs. And this time the jolt was stronger, and oddly enough she could feel her breasts tingle. Again he pushed and it seemed to have nothing to do with her. It was simply his hand moving hers as strange feelings began to build inside her, and she squirmed, moving her legs farther apart, and he laughed softly, increasing the pressure. After a while you can be more forceful, he whispered against the side of her neck. What first you wooed must now be mastered, or it might escape completely, leaving you restless and distraught. He pushed harder, much harder, and she made a small whimpering noise, not of pain. Just as you feel it will never happen 
the first blush of pleasure sweeps over you. She had stopped thinking, as a small, exquisite jolt stirred her body. And then you push it farther. His mouth was hot against her skin, and deeper. She could feel something dark and terrible approaching, and she tried to pull back in sudden fear, and you don't let anything stop you. With his other hand, he pressed her face against his greatcoat, and he moved her hand with sudden force and speed, and the dark place opened and pulled her in, and he muffled her cry against his shoulder as wave after wave of exquisite pleasure washed over her. Finally, he drew her shaking hand back from between her legs. He brought it to his mouth and kissed it, then put it on her lap. He still held her face against his shoulder, his arm around her, and as the wicked jerks of pleasure faded, shame flooded in around it. When she yanked herself away, he let her go, and she stumbled as she landed on the opposite seat, her face red, her breath coming far too quickly. You animal, she said in low fury, how dare you? How dare I what, my precious? he said in an entirely equable tone of voice. I did nothing. It was your hand. She wanted to scream at him, to cry bitter tears and rage at him. But the time for that was many years past. She cleared her throat. Clearly you have some great need to debauch everyone who comes within your circle, my lord. You may consider yourself the victor. I didn't take your virginity, little one, he murmured, and self-pleasure is hardly debauchery. It's in the Bible. She couldn't bring herself to look at him. The flame of color still rode high in her cheeks, and she couldn't think how he'd managed to do that, to take her distrustful self and make her. It was appalling, and she didn't want to think about it. He was a degenerate a notorious one, and the sooner she escaped from his presence, the better she would be. That's all I'm going to get, isn't it, ma petite? he said lazily. I expect you want more, but you'd never admit to it. I shall now endeavor to catch some much-needed sleep and spare your maidenly blushes, unless you'd consider having a second lesson. No? I thought not. I have two more days of carousing left, and at my advanced age, I need my strength. He smiled at her with angelic innocence. Cat got your tongue, my pet. With supreme effort, she pulled herself together, looking at him with acute dislike. If you sleep, you'll stop talking, which would be a blessing, she said. And at your advanced age, I can see that you would most definitely benefit from it. There was a sudden, charred silence in the carriage. My dear Miss Harriman, if you continue to amuse me, it will be extremely difficult for me to keep my hands off you. There are very few people who don't bore me, and I tend to be possessive about those I find entertaining. I shall proceed to snore, she said snapping her eye closed. She heard him laugh. It was a wicked sound, soft and low, and for many women irresistible. But she wasn't many women. Her body still trembled from the aftermath of what he... what they had done. She folded her bare hands beneath the fur pelisse and stared out the window, ignoring him. It was the noise that awoke her. The carriage clattered over the rough cobbles of the city streets, and her eyes flew open to meet his. Once again, Miss Harriman, you have slept with me, he said. Once might be forgiven by a disapproving society. Twice puts you quite beyond the pale. I think you should give up any pretensions to modesty and return to my chateau with me. Or my townhouse is quite large. You could wander around there for days and never see anyone. We could spend hours in bed. Don't be tiresome, Monsieur Le Comte, she said sharply. 
the last traces of sleep ripped away. How could she have fallen asleep in his presence? Particularly after what he'd done to her. How could she have been so foolish? She straightened her shoulders. In fact, we're not far from my house, and I believe this carriage is too wide for the narrow streets. Why don't you let me down here and I'll walk the rest of the way? I'm certain Mrs. Clark will forgive you. Dear child, he said, I have no intention of abandoning you in your hour of need. Besides, I have to find out what exactly you're so desperate to keep hidden. A strapping live-in lover? Perhaps you live in a brothel and your sainted mother is one of your most lucrative whores. No, that doesn't seem likely. But there's most assuredly something at your home that you don't want me to see, and I'm surmising it's your exquisitely beautiful and most definitely not dead younger sister. You must know my curiosity, like all my appetites, is insatiable. I don't— She slapped a hand over her mouth, bending over. Stop the carriage, she said in a strangled voice. Her companion didn't move. Are you unwell? You turned quite a shade just then. I'm going to be sick. If you don't stop and let me out, I'm going to cast up my accounts all over your expensive carriage, she said in a harsh, muffled voice. That would be a great deal too bad, but carriages can be cleaned. I have servants for that. She looked up at him, her hands still clamped over her mouth. Do you want to ride back to your chateau in a closed carriage filled with the results? An excellent point. He rapped on the carriage wall behind him, and the conveyance came to an abrupt stop, hurtling her forward. She caught herself in time, just before she ended in his arms. He'd unfastened the police at her neck at some point during the wicked play he'd forced on her, and she thrust it off her shoulders, scrambling for the door just as the footman let down the steps. With one hand clamped to her mouth and another against her stomach, she let the footman help her out of the carriage as she groaned piteously. A light snow was falling, making the wretched area look almost pretty. She felt the ground beneath her feet, and for a moment she began to sink to her knees in order to relieve herself of her last meal. She leaned toward the footman, making a gagging noise, and he drew back instinctively, releasing her. It was all she needed. In a moment she was gone, disappearing into the throngs that crowded the main thoroughfare of that miserable part of the city. She could bless the new boots and thank Mrs. Clark most heartily for them, she thought as she raced through the streets, turning corners, making her way deeper and deeper into the seedy underbelly of Rue de Pelican. He would be no match for her. She could outrun anybody when she so desired, thanks to her long legs and determination, and besides, she knew this area well. The footman would be at a loss. No. Monsieur Le Comte would have no choice but to return to his den of iniquity, and Lydia would be safe. Eleanor slowed down to a brisk trot, pulling her shawl more tightly about her. He would have had to get out and walk. That, or have his coachman find a sedan chair in order to reach the back alley that held their wretched little house, and even then he'd have a hard time finding it. Granted, one of his coachmen knew of the place, since Jacobs had been forced to direct him there in order to return her mother, but by the time Francis Rohan got home, he would have lost interest in a plain woman with a secret. The alleyway that held her small house looked even more dismal than usual, and as she scrambled up the two steps to the entry, she felt the cold begin to reach into her bones. That police had been lovely, and would have looked beautiful on Lydia. But safety was a far greater treasure. She pushed open the door and froze, momentarily afraid that somehow Lord Rohan had managed to defy the laws of nature and arrive there before her. A tall man was standing over her sister, and even in the shadowy light she could see her sister's vivid smile—
and she let out a groan, a real one this time. The man turned, and it wasn't Rohan. Of course it wasn't. It was the scarred man from the night before. The one who had had a half-clad demi-mondaine on his arm. A man who was talking to her sister, looking at her. A man who was no better than Rohan himself. Lydia jumped up, her smile wider than ever. Nell, I was so worried about you, she cried. Mr. Redding told me there was nothing to be concerned about, but you were gone all night, and ever since that time you went away to Italy, I've been... I'm fine, darling, Eleanor said swiftly, forestalling Lydia's artless comments. Even if Lydia hadn't been able to put two and two together, a more jaded member of society would have no trouble jumping to conclusions, and she couldn't afford to let that happen. This is Mr. Redding, Nell. He was kind enough to escort Mummy home. Only Lydia called Lady Caroline by the cosy Mummy. If their mother had had any favorite besides her own dedicated self-interest, it would be her lovely younger daughter. Eleanor herself looked too much like her father's branch of the family, and she had what Lady Caroline considered to be the disconcerting habit of giving her opinion when asked. She hadn't bothered sugarcoating it for her mother in years, and Lady Caroline hadn't thanked her. Very kind, Eleanor murmured, but we can handle things from this point. She couldn't quite hold the door for him, but she still made her point that he needed to leave, and now. His smile tugged at the ugly scar on his otherwise handsome face. Rohan would expect nothing less from me. Your mother appears to have quieted, but I'm not sure I should take the footman with me, even though I'm being summarily dismissed. It was a challenge, one Eleanor met smoothly. It's starting to snow, and it's a long way back to the chateau. I wouldn't want to be responsible for you getting caught in a snowdrift. Only if you pushed me in, Miss Harriman, which you look tempted to do. He caught Lydia's small hand in his and gave her an extravagant kiss. There was no mistaking the look in her sister's eyes, though Eleanor hoped and prayed Redding wasn't alert enough to read it. Let me just check on our mother, Eleanor said. I would expect from the blissful silence emanating from the bedroom that she's well settled and we have no more need of your so generous assistance. She turned trying not to shiver in the cool morning air. There wasn't much of a fire in the grate, and she had no idea where they'd get more wood. But first things first, and getting rid of the man standing far too close to her baby sister was utmost. She had no choice but to leave them together long enough for her to see to Lady Caroline, but then she could shoo him out quite handily. Two of Rohan's liveried footmen stood in the hallway almost on guard, and at Eleanor's approach they moved out of the way, bowing. She pushed open the door to see Nanny sitting beside her mother. Lady Caroline lay still in the narrow bed, with only the fitful light of the winter morning to pierce the darkness. She hasn't moved since they brought her back, poor thing, Nanny said. I washed her and tried to make her more comfortable, and told the gentleman that he can safely leave. Your poor mother probably won't be up for days. She looked back at her charge. If ever. Eleanor looked down at her mother. Her skin was bluish, with deep circles around her eyes. But for the moment she was at peace. Has she taken any food? Nanny Maud knew better than she did just how little food there was in their larder. Some weak tea, and a bit of gruel. She spat out more than she took in. And they couldn't afford to waste what little they had. I'll send Lydia in while I get rid of our visitors, Eleanor said. What are you going to do, Miss Nell? Nanny said plaintively. I've sent Jacobs out to see what he can find but there's nothing left for me to make a dinner out of. 
No wood for the fire unless we take this bed apart. Eleanor wanted to put her hands to her face and scream, but her calm expression showed none of it. It was up to her to see to things, and even if she hadn't the vaguest idea what she was going to do, she didn't need to share that. She couldn't even sell her body on the streets for money. Paris was filled with beautiful whores. She'd barely make enough to keep them fed, if that. Jacobs could sell the boots and the silk stockings. She'd been a proud fool to have left the fur police behind. That could have supported them for weeks if they were careful. She was going to have to go back and meet with that wretched lawyer, petition her unknown cousin, her stupid pride in the dust. She could hear the noise from beyond the closed door, and she breathed a sigh of relief. The intruders were leaving. Men were such noisy creatures there was no mistaking their footsteps or the sound of their flimsy front door closing. I'll go find Jacobs, she said calmly. We're not out of options yet. Eleanor pushed open the door. Lydia, my dear, could you— her voice trailed off as her worst fears came to fruition. The scarred gentleman stood off to one side, an unreadable expression on his face. And Francis Rohan, the Prince of Darkness, the King of Hell, stood over her sister, holding Lydia's small, delicate hand in his. 7. She wasn't pleased to see him. That much was evident, and Francis Rohan bestowed his most charming smile on her. You forgot to wait for me, Miss Harriman. I had quite a time catching up with you. He didn't miss the momentary panic in her fine eyes, quickly replaced by that same maddening calm she wrapped about her more fiercely than the ragged cloak she'd worn. There was no need for you to come all this way, Monsieur le Comte. I know these streets very well, and no one would dare accost me. Now that doesn't surprise me in the least. You'd terrify the king himself. But you left your cloak behind. And despite my many failings, I have exquisite manners, haven't I, Redding? His friend bowed slightly in agreement. Exquisite. And I've just met your lovely sister. She moved with astonishing speed somehow managing to come between him and the pretty little chit whose hand he'd been holding, and everything suddenly made sense, which pleased him. He preferred his life with a certain order, and anomalies, while entertaining, needed to be explained before one could move on. Though the anomaly that was Eleanor Harriman was going to take a bit longer to figure out. Thank you so much for coming, she said her voice brooking no opposition. You've been extremely kind, but we wouldn't think of keeping you from your guests. She was tall enough and solid, but he could simply pick her up and move her out of the way if he had any interest in the pretty little sister. He had not. He'd had enough pretty girls and beautiful women to last him a lifetime. This other one, however, was proving interesting. He was still aroused from their time in the carriage. If he hadn't pretended to fall asleep, he would have had her skirts up over her head in a minute. She was standing too close to him for her own comfort, but she was determined to shield her sister from his lascivious eyes, and Redding had looked a bit abstracted when he'd first walked in, though his young friend would never make the mistake of wasting his time on an impoverished virgin. He had a fortune to make, and he'd always been dependable. Yes, Miss Harriman, he said, not moving. Wondering how far she'd go to get rid of him, if she'd put those pale hands on him. Wondering how he would react if she did. We thank you for your help, my lord, she said in her most polite voice. I believe we can dispense with it at this point. A faint smile touched his mouth. You're an impressive guardian, and my curiosity is satisfied now that I know what treasure you're so determined to protect.
you may rest assured that I am far too jaded to be attracted to mere beauty. Your sister is safe from me. Nell, the young girl said in an irritated voice, would you stop being so ridiculous? Nell, he echoed, ignoring everything else about the conversation except what interested him. That's quite charming. I... Good day, my Lord Rohan, Miss Eleanor Harriman said firmly. Come on, Francis, Redding said. We have the revels to return to. We wouldn't want them to have too much fun without us. Ah, yes, he said, finally moving away from her. While he would have been very interested to see if she really would go so far as to push him, the thought of her hands on him was far too enticing, and the circumstances were far from ideal. There were too many witnesses. Lydia managed to move from behind her sister's imposing presence. Thank you again for all your help, Mr. Redding, and my Lord Rohan. She curtsied prettily enough, and her older sister frowned. It was never his nature to let an opportunity slide by. It was my pleasure, Miss Lydia, he said in his most flattering tones, relieved that he remembered her name. The sight of your beauty is reward enough. Her older sister reacted exactly as he wanted her to, stiffening. If he were younger and more foolish, her dragon-like protection would have ensured his eventual debauchery of the pretty little thing. But at this point it just seemed too tiresome. Besides, he had the impression that Redding wouldn't like it. Miss Harriman, your servant, he said giving her a bow of such extravagant proportions that she'd know she was being mocked. But she'd already turned back to her sister, and his gesture was wasted. He waited until they were back out in the narrow alley that held the tumble-down house. His carriage was only a few steps away. She'd lied about the difficulty in getting there. His blue silk shoes were quite ruined by the snow and the filth in the street. Quite the interesting family, are they not? Redding frowned. I think you should keep your hands off her, Francis. There are more than enough women at the chateau to occupy your time. But I'm not going back to the chateau. My honored guests will doubtless notice I'm gone, but it won't make much impression on them. This was only a casual weekend. We still have the spring revels to plan. Besides, I find her oddly enchanting. Redding was obviously not happy with him. A curious event in itself. She has a hard lot enough. The place was freezing, and if they had firewood hidden somewhere, I'd be very much surprised. And while she's pleasantly shaped, I suspect she doesn't get much to eat. I think the best thing you could do is arrange a marriage for her. Francis turned to look at his old friend. Charles, there are times when you astonish me with your perspicacity. That is exactly what I should do. The only problem is finding a willing partner. Don't be ridiculous, she's exquisite. Any man would be honored to have her. They'd reached the carriage, and Francis paused as he was about to ascend the steps. Dear boy, I believe we're talking at cross-purposes. Is it Miss Lydia you're protecting so fiercely? Of course. Are you going to tell me you don't have designs on her? She's an absolute diamond and you know it. He was sounding particularly glum. I fancy the diamond sister, Francis said, half amazed at the truth of his words. Though you're absolutely right. She'll be much easier to handle if she's married. I think my cousin should do nicely. He climbed into the carriage, and Redding followed him. You mean the doctor? Who better? He settled himself on the leather seat, draping his long coats around him with great care. He needs a wife to help him with his practice, and she needs a doctor to attend to her mother. I'll send him over this afternoon.
Is this the sour young man I met? As I recall, he's not too happy you have the title. Is he likely to want to do you any favors? It's true, Francis said, picking a speck of dirt from his sleeve. This area of the city was truly atrocious, but as yet there was nothing he could do about it. He thinks the French title should belong to him. Unfortunately, he was born on the wrong side of the blanket, and the old title had to devolve onto an émigré Englishman. I've been more than generous with the boy, and he's wise enough to know that following my wishes is the best way to get his hands on at least some of the family estate if I don't work through it first. You have more money than God, Francis. It would take a superhuman effort to lose all your money, and even you couldn't accomplish it. Francis gave Redding his seraphic smile. Don't doubt me, dear boy. I can do anything I want if I set my mind to it. Redding's reluctant laugh was encouraging. That I don't doubt. I stand corrected. What say we return to the party after all? The spring revels won't be for another few weeks, and I see a long, dull period stretching in front of us. I have every intention of entertaining myself, Redding. You should know me well enough to realize that celibacy is no more for the likes of me than monogamy. And I've decided to celebrate Lent this year on a grand scale. Oh, bloody Christ, Redding said. Precisely. And I'm going to have Miss Harriman to entertain me. You don't think your cousin Etienne would have something to say about that, presuming you managed to marry her off? No, he'd give me his own sister if I asked for her. In fact, I'd offer his sister to you, but she's alarmingly fat and fecund, and you don't want any offspring until you've bagged your heiress. Redding's sardonic smile tugged at his scarred face. Indeed. But what makes you think that the dragon will lift her skirts for you once she's married? She's the frighteningly respectable sort. Why would you suppose she'd succumb to your evil machinations? They always do, dear boy. And Miss Harriman... He paused. Good heavens. A moment later, there was a loud crack from outside the carriage. That's something I don't hear from you very often, Redding said. Good heavens, what? You have the strangest look on your face. Francis glanced down at the fine blue satin of his coat. First my shoes are ruined, and now this, he said in a faint voice. I'm afraid we're going to have to see my cousin sooner rather than later. Because? Because I do believe I've been shot, Francis said. Tell the coachman to hurry, would you? And he closed his eyes to the sounds of Redding pounding on the carriage wall, and the whole conveyance came to an abrupt halt. Lydia loved her older sister more than any human being in this world, but at that moment she was more than a little cross with her. Was that entirely necessary? she said. You were being ridiculous. Eleanor lifted her head, and for the first time Lydia noticed how pale she was. You don't realize how very bad Viscount Rohan is, she said in a subdued voice. I assure you, Nell, he has absolutely no interest in me, she said. Don't you think I'd be able to tell by now? Any attention he paid to me was simply to annoy you. Eleanor flushed, which was odd. She was unused to a calm older sister looking disturbed. You mistake the matter she said. He's the very fiend of duplicity. To lower one's guard around him would be courting disaster. More and more interesting. Did you lower your guard around him, dearest? Lydia said. Because he was certainly watching you quite closely, did he do anything to you? Offer you an insult? Of course not, Eleanor said with a shaky laugh.
Do I look like the kind of woman to interest a libertine like Lord Rohan? He merely has a peculiar sense of humor, one he uses to torment others. You may be right. He certainly has his choice of some of the greatest beauties of Paris. I still insist you be careful if you happen to encounter him again. I would presume that we shan't be bothered by him any more in future, but it would be a mistake to assume that fate would be kind. I think we'll see him again, Lydia said, not bothering to cover her small smile. Eleanor caught it. If you find something amusing about this situation, I would be most grateful if you would share it with me, because the humor of it escapes my attention entirely. He likes you, Nell. And why shouldn't he? Any man with sense would see what a wonderful woman you are. He won't be able to keep away from you. Stop it, Eleanor said in a sharper tone than Lydia had ever heard from her. She took a deep breath. For one thing, you are wrong. Yesterday, I was a curiosity, nothing more. A, a virtuous woman in a land of whores. He's a shallow man, easily bored. He doesn't strike me as shallow, Nell. Eleanor ignored her. Secondly, even if he did harbor some demented attraction for me, his intentions would be worse than dishonorable. You know the gossip we've heard about the heavenly host. It's true. They drink the blood of virgins? Lydia shrieked, horrified. Of course not, Eleanor said in a cranky voice. The other rumors. They gather together for the most licentious of activities, wearing strange garments and behaving like, like animals. You wouldn't want me to be part of such a world, would you, even if he wanted me? Lydia looked at her sister's brown eyes, more troubled than she'd seen them in many years. I'm sorry, love. I've been thoughtless. I hate to see you judge yourself so unfairly, but you're right. That kind of interest would be disastrous. That goes for Mr. Redding as well, Liddy. Lydia knew how to bat her eyes and fool landlords and creditors. She could fool her sister as well, particularly since Eleanor was so distraught. Besides, he'd been nothing but polite, that twisted beautiful face of his mostly devoid of expression. Just as Lydia knew how to fool people, she could also read them better than most. Charles Redding was different. Beneath his determinately distant behavior, she knew he was feeling the same odd, irrational pull that was knotting her stomach and making her knees shake. She, who had flirted with any number of handsome young men and remained untouched. All it had taken was a scarred, unhappy man, and she was dreaming. No, she was losing her mind. The house was cold and the last bit of the fire almost out. Eleanor didn't know, but Lydia planned to meet with Monsieur Garot, the greengrocer, this evening when he closed up shop, and she was going to do whatever she had to do to shoulder some of the burden that Eleanor took on herself. She was calm, determined, undespairing. She knew as well as Nell that Charles Redding wasn't for her. It didn't mean that she couldn't dream. Of course, Nell, she said absently. He's of no interest to me. I'm waiting for a wealthy prince, remember? And Eleanor smiled back at her, too abstracted to realize that for the first time her sister was lying to her. He really wasn't in the mood to deal with all this, Rohan thought several hours later, from his exceedingly uncomfortable position on the narrow cot in Etienne's well-equipped surgery. That had been money well spent, he mused dreamily. In fact, it had been simply to occupy a hot-headed Frenchman from being an annoyance. He never thought it might save his life one day. They'd given him laudanum. He was familiar enough with its delightful effects to recognize it, and he welcomed the drugged days.
He could remember a few unhappy moments when Etienne had dug around in the flesh of his upper arm for the bullet, and no doubt the young man had taken a fair amount of pleasure in inflicting pain on his so-called usurper. But that was all in the hazy past, and if he could just get a bit more comfortable— You're coming around, cousin. He turned his head to see Etienne de Giverny looking at him in pinched disapproval. He'd be a handsome young man, if only he didn't have the unfortunate tendency to sneer. And Francis considered informing him of that when he realized it was the effect of the laudanum. Saved my life, did you, Etienne? he murmured. That must have gone against the grain. Hardly. The bullet was in your arm, not your heart. Whoever shot you did a very poor job of it. Which must sadden you tremendously. I do think assassins should know what they are doing, Etienne said in his clipped voice. Francis was emerging from the drug days reluctantly. He struggled to sit up without any aid from his unwilling doctor. You think that was what it was? An assassination attempt. Since you were in town, I doubt it was a hunting accident, Etienne said coolly. And I imagine there are a great many people who would like to see you dead. Francis straightened his back. His arm was wrapped in layers of gauze, and despite the drugs, the pain was more than annoying. He was going home to soak himself in brandy until it stopped. Perhaps, but none of them are crack shots. Whoever it was missed his target, Etienne pointed out. He came close enough considering the circumstances. A busy city street, the protection of a carriage. I imagine we should look for a talented marksman. Perhaps someone newly discharged from the army. Well, should you ever discover him, you can give him your compliments on his marksmanship. Rohan controlled his irritation. Where's my shirt? And where's Redding? He's been doing your bidding. You had quite a list of commands before you finally succumbed to the laudanum. A servant should arrive with fresh clothes momentarily. I had to shred your coat and shirt. They were soaked with blood. There would be no salvaging them anyway. Tompi, I can always buy more, he said deliberately, just to see Etienne's brow darken. And just who is it you're trying to corrupt at the moment? Francis smiled pleasantly. Anyone who comes near me, Etienne. Did you have someone in mind? Etienne made an annoyed click of his tongue. You had Redding dispatching firewood and food to some place in Rue de Pelican. Don't you realize you could have anyone from that area raise her skirts for a few sous? I agree, it's not a very savory area, but you'll find there are a couple of very virtuous young ladies in residence. With their ill maman, I'd like you to call on them. See if there's anything you can do for the poor woman, he said, trying his best to look saintly. Charity is unlike you. He laughed. Oh, acquit me of any such motives. I have nothing but the most impure thoughts when it comes to one of the young women. I'd like you to see to the mother's swift and painless passing and marry the older girl. She'll provide you an excellent wife, commonsensical and plain-spoken. She'll organize your life and your practice and give you a dozen hopeful children. There was a moment's silence. You still have the capacity to surprise me, Etienne said finally. I'm not going to kill some old woman for you, nor am I about to marry some woman so you can debauch her younger sister. In fact, the mother's not that old, but she's dying of the Spanish disease and her mind's gone. Rohan poked at his arm, then winced. She'll be dead in a matter of months anyway, and it's your future wife I wish to debauch. Etienne stared at him. There are times, Francis, when I wonder if you're quite mad. In my own way, 
I take it you don't fancy the idea of aiding me? No. I would be most grateful if you'd consider it, he said. You know I tend to express my gratitude in tangible ways. He could see the light of greed in his cousin's flat black eyes. And the mother could do with the doctor's care. I could send someone else, of course, but I thought I should offer such an opportunity to my dear cousin and heir. Etienne drew himself upright. I'll go see the poor woman, because I swore an oath to attend the sick. And you're not going to see me inherit the title. You'll marry on your deathbed and beget an heir just to spite me, he said in a voice that wasn't far from a whine. What a wonderful opinion you have of my virility, Rohan replied. As it is, I have no interest in begetting anything. Assist me in this matter, at least as far as the woman goes. It's always possible that you might suddenly become enamored of her daughter. You need a wife, and she'd be a lucrative pick. You'd settle money on her, simply in order to get her into bed? Etienne said, aghast. Don't I do the very same thing with the beautiful whores who attend me? Even the grand ladies offer up their charms for a price, be it jewels or flattery. Sex is always some kind of transaction, and I have no hesitation in paying the price. Etienne shook his head. You're an extremely cynical man, cousin. As you are, mon fils. With great difficulty, he managed to swing his legs over the side of the small cot. For a moment, the world swirled about him most unpleasantly, and then it came back into focus. I believe I hear a commotion outside. I expect it's Redding, back from his errands of mercy. Direct your man to assist him. I have no man, cousin. Just an elderly widow who helps me in the surgery, and I'm not about to have her wait on a spoiled aristocrat. Francis smiled his most angelic smile. You'd be very happy to be a spoiled aristocrat yourself, Etienne admitted. This man of the people air you affect is simply because of circumstance, not preference. And you'll have to get rid of the woman. I think Miss Harriman might tend to be the jealous, possessive sort, and she wouldn't want you in close quarters with a comely widow. And don't try to pretend she's not comely, Etienne. I know your taste too well. If the woman you desire is the jealous, possessive sort, then why are you interested? Those are qualities that have proven anathema to you in the past. Rohan was struck. You know, you are quite right. I have no idea why I am so intent on debauching a young woman who will give me nothing but trouble. But then, I've never spent over much time examining my motives. I want her. That's enough. He looked up as Redding was ushered into the room, indeed by a buxom young woman who could only be Etienne's elderly widow. Have you come to rescue me, dear boy? There's only so much of Etienne's disapproval that I can bear. The carriage awaits. The food and wood have been delivered, with furniture and rugs and bedding to follow. Are you certain you want to bother? You can dress a pig up in satin and lace, and it's still a pig. Francis smiled hazily. It had been a long day. In fact, a long pair of days— though he usually survives sleepless nights quite well. Are you calling my intended a pig, Charles? Charles raised a dark eyebrow. Intended what, Francis? You surely can't be having respectable inclinations toward this girl. The bullet hit your arm, not your head. No such thing, my boy. I'm too old to change. He turned to look at his sullen cousin. Etienne, do you have more of that lovely laudanum? I think I'll need medicinal assistance for the ride back to Maison de Giverny.
He wasn't so far gone that he missed the pinched expression Etienne always wore at the mention of the Paris mansion that should have been his. You've had enough. But if you give me more, I might accidentally take too much and die. And then where would you be? he said sweetly. It will take but a moment. The moment he left the room, Rohan turned to Charles. The two women will be removed from the sty as soon as it's feasible. These things must be handled delicately, with finesse, and I've never been a clumsy man. Give me your arm. This place smells of cabbage and death. The sooner I return to my own bed, the happier I shall be. Your cousin has gone to get you more laudanum. I merely got tired of his sour face. He can send it later. Perhaps we ought to send someone to cheer him up. Marianne, for instance. He rose to his stocking feet unsteadily. Get me out of here, for mercy's sake. I have evil plans to hatch. Are you with me? Every step of the way, Redding said, taking his arm. We're going to hell, you know. That was ascertained many years ago, Charles. Thank God. Thank God, Charles echoed heartily. But even in his drug state, Rohan could hear the faint thread of doubt in his friend's voice as they headed out into the snowy evening. 8. As far as days went, this one was looking as miserable as the day before. Once Rohan had left, Eleanor had waited only long enough to make certain her mother and sister had no need of her, and then she set off to find the lawyer, Mr. Mitchum. Her proud departure yesterday had been put in perspective. There was no room for pride when Lydia was at stake, no room for pride when the Prince of Darkness had set his sights on her sister. Eleanor had been a fool to walk out without seeking an appointment with her father's heir, but the disappointment had been too deep. Without a generous inheritance, they were doomed. She never would have thought she'd be so impulsive. In the last six years, she'd considered herself calm, practical, thoughtful. Now, in one rash moment of temper, she might have put her sister and her small motley family in danger, and her self-contempt knew no limits. Mr. Mitchum was no help at all. At least the new Baron Tolliver hadn't left France, but for the moment he was out of town, visiting friends in the country. There was no telling when he'd return, or even if he'd still be willing to see his poor female relation at that point. Perhaps if Miss Harriman were to return in a week's time, an appointment might be arranged. They might be lost in a week's time, Eleanor thought grimly, scurrying through the wintry streets of Paris. The snow was falling, swirling down in pretty patterns, and at another time she might have appreciated it. Not on this bitterly cold evening. Once she'd left the lawyer, she'd walked for hours more of her fruitless quest for employment. In this area of Paris, people could barely find enough to survive. No one had the money or the interest in learning the fine art of playing the piano fort or stitching a perfect seam, particularly since no one could afford to own a piano fort, and needlework was kept for more practical applications. Just as well, because her needlework was appalling, and it had been years since anyone had been forced to listen to her on the piano fort. She pulled the shawl around her more tightly. Her own cloak that she'd left behind at the chateau was warmer than the flimsy wool. Rohan had brought the stolen fur-lined cloak, but Eleanor had enough sense not to wear it into the streets. Chances were it would have been ripped away from her in a matter of minutes. One did not display items of such worth in a desperate neighborhood such as this. And indeed, she'd left Lydia wrapped in it, warm and comfortable in the icy house, so it served its purpose. She just had to hope Lydia didn't have an attack of guilt and cover their mother with it. Lady Caroline was beyond knowing if she was hot or cold.
and she'd thrown everything away. She didn't deserve the one bit of comfort in their barren home, Eleanor thought with fierce bitterness. Tomorrow, she would sell the cloak. Tonight, they were going to have to break up the furniture in order to keep from freezing, and she wasn't sure where to start. Her mother's bed would be the obvious choice. The rest of them were already sleeping on the floor, but if Lady Caroline had a pallet on the floor, there'd be no way to restrain her, and that was even more dangerous than freezing to death. It would have to be the chairs or the table, and she couldn't decide which was more necessary. They were young enough and agile enough to sit comfortably on the floor, though Nanny and Jacobs had a much harder time of it. Nanny Maud had frequently napped as she sat beside Lady Caroline on the bed, her back against one of the posts, but that could hardly serve as her main mode of sitting. Darkness was falling, and what little safety there was in the streets that surrounded them was fading fast as well. She had no choice but to head back, having failed in the most simple of quests. She thought back to that tray of cinnamon toast strips and wanted to cry. There was an odd light coming from the small windows that looked out onto the street, and Eleanor paused, momentarily confused. One house did look much like another, and she might have mistaken where she was, but no, she could hear Lydia's voice raised in laughter, and she burst through the door, suddenly terrified that her nemesis had returned. The room was warm. Waves of heat coming from the crackling fire in the hearth, with stacks of wood waiting to one side. There were candles lit all around, putting a temporary pleasant glow on their poverty, and she could smell the unbelievable scent of roasting chicken from the small room that served as kitchen and servants' quarters. She looked around, somewhat desperately, but there was no tall, dangerously beautiful man in sight. No one at all but Lydia and Nanny Maud. Isn't it wonderful, Nell? Lydia cried, jumping up. The wood arrived just an hour after you left, more than enough to keep the kitchen fire going as well for weeks. And then the food. You wouldn't believe it. Flour and sugar and tea, fresh cream and butter, and chicken, potatoes, sausages. Nanny's already made us scones. It's heavenly. Not quite, Eleanor thought. Remember Rohan's satanic smile. There'll be a price to pay for all this, she said in a doer voice, stripping off the threadbare shawl and advancing into the cosy room. One I'll gladly pay, Lydia said cheerfully. If I have to trade my innocence for a warm bed and a chicken dinner, then I'll do so without hesitation. This scone itself is worth any number of indecent favors. Don't make light of it, Liddy, she said sharply. This isn't an act of disinterested charity. Lydia popped the rest of the scone in her mouth, then smiled beatifically. No, I suppose it's not. But for some reason I doubt Lord Rohan would be the kind of man who'd force you, no matter how wicked he likes to think himself. I think he likes the thrill of the chase. Liddy, darling, she said, crossing the room and taking a scone. He's a heartless, soulless libertine. I doubt there's anything he'd refrain from doing simply for moral principles. He has no moral principles. Perhaps not. I suspect he's not the villain he pretends to be. He likes the challenge, the power. Using force would be too clumsy for him. He'd consider it failure. You're right about that much, Eleanor said. But it's not me he'd want, and I'm not letting any man— She took a bite of the scone. Take liberties with you. She took another bite. I'm here to protect you. She closed her eyes. And— Damn, you're right. This is enough to make one surrender one's honor in a trice. Don't use such language, Miss Eleanor, Nanny Maud said. You've been spending too much time in these awful streets and around your mother. <laughs>
Our awful mother, Lydia said with a giggle. And I didn't make the scones. They arrived along with everything else. Real Devonshire clotted cream, strong black tea from China, fresh strawberry preserves. Even the chicken was already butchered and dressed, ready for the pot. Someone thinks I can't cook, she said with offended dignity. Someone thinks you have way too many things to worry about and thought you deserve some assistance, Lydia assured her. She twirled around the room, practically giddy. Don't you see, Nell? We have a guardian angel, and who cares if he's a fallen one? I'm not afraid of him. You're wrong. He has no nefarious designs on me, and you're more than a match for him. If he has wicked motives, he's going to be sorely disappointed. Eleanor couldn't help it. The fire called to her with its siren warmth. She sank down on her knees in front of it, holding out her chilled hand as Lydia brought a cup of tea, real tea, over to her and sat down beside her. The heat was sinking into her bones, and for a brief moment she simply wanted to put her head down on the rough floor and weep. There's someone at the door, Nanny Maud said in her customarily cranky voice. Tell Lord Rohan to go away. Eleanor said. We're not entertaining guests at this hour. It's not him, she said darkly. There are a bunch of them. Probably come to take the things back. They were brought here by mistake. Then definitely tell them to go away, Eleanor said, feeling somewhat giddy herself. They're not taking my fire or my tea. Jacob stomped in from the kitchen clearly annoyed with the lot of them, and opened the door. More fripperies, he said in a doer voice that couldn't disguise his pleasure. You watch where you put those things, laddie. He moved out of the way as a line of men entered the house bearing furniture, rugs, mattresses, and arms of linens. Eleanor sprang to her feet. You can't bring those in here. Sorry, miss, but we've got orders, one man said as he dropped one end of the settee to the right of the fire. We're not taking these things back. Just tell us where you want us to put it. We've got orders not to leave until you're satisfied. And I won't be satisfied until these things are gone, she said sharply. Watch yourself, said Nanny Maud, slapping at a young man carrying a small desk. I can't help you there, miss, he said. I'm a lot more frightened of his lordship than I am of you. He told me to come back and report to him, and I don't like the thought of what he'd say if I brought anything back. Eleanor turned back to Lydia. This is impossible. Next they'll be delivering clothes and undergarments. A wistful smile crossed Lydia's face. It would be so nice to have pretty undergarments again. Don't be ridiculous. I'm going to put a stop to this right now. She pushed past the man carrying the rug and reached for her shawl. You can't go out now. I can, and I will. It's still early. I can inform his lordship that his inappropriate gifts should be removed immediately. Not the chicken, Lydia said in a plaintive voice. Eleanor paused. No. Not the chicken, or the scones, or the firewood, she added with a shiver. The constantly opening door was spreading blasts of cold through the house. You're not going out to that chateau again, Nanny Maud said in a shrill voice. No need. He's at his townhouse, over on the Rue Saint-Honoré, said the helpful man, who seemed to be the leader of this never-ending line of furniture movers. I'm Roland, in charge of the Count's household possessions. I can promise you these things are merely cast-offs from his overfield house. It is still unacceptable. I'm going. I can take you there, if need be, Roland offered. Eleanor looked at him suspiciously. Did he tell you to bring me? <laughs>
I don't talk to the Count, mademoiselle, he said. Just the steward. And no one said anything about bringing you back. Just trying to be helpful. She looked at him for a long moment. It was a cold, dark night. Snow was falling, and finding Lord Rohan's townhouse could be problematic at best. She had no choice. The more things he sent, the harder it would be to get rid of them. It wasn't simply the fact that if anyone heard of it, Lydia's reputation would be ruined. This was how their mother had lived, how they had lived, dependent on the largesse of a man with wicked plans. She was not going to follow in her mother's footsteps. She simply was not. Rohan wouldn't listen, of course, no matter how she tried to explain it. If she had any sense, she would sit back by the fire in one of the new chairs the men had brought and accept it for the sake of a poor family. What was honor if your family was starving to death? But there was still her missing cousin. They weren't devoid of all hope. They could accept this and nothing more, and she would make that clear. Let's go, she said. Allons-y. The ride from the gutter to the elegant streets of Paris was surprisingly short, given the disparity between the residences. A good thing. Roland's mode of transportation was a wagon, the only seat being beside the helpful driver and the wind seemed to grow colder with each breath she took. She tried to concentrate on his stories of his grown son, his grandchildren, his bad leg, but by the time he slowed the horses, she was shivering. Here we are, mademoiselle, he said, coming to a stop. Would you like me to come with you? This isn't the sort of household that welcomes people like us, not at the front door. People like us, she thought, startled. And then the truth hit. In fact, this servant was better dressed than she was. His old clothes were worn, but patched. She'd had to put on her last dress when she'd arrived home earlier that day, and she'd torn the skirt on a loose nail. For a moment she wavered. Someone of Rohan's wealth and stature would hardly have nefarious designs on a young woman who lived in worse surroundings than his own servants. But then she remembered that Rohan didn't have a charitable bone in his body. He lived for his decadent desires. All truistic gestures were beyond him. It didn't matter what had happened in his youth to wound him. He was the man he'd become— and that man was dangerous. He'll want to see me, she said with false certainty, sliding down off the wagon before Roland could help her. Just in case, mademoiselle, I'll wait here for you. There's no need. Just in case. You're a very kind man, Roland, she said. I will tell his lordship to double what he's paying you. His lordship pays very generously, and I'm doing this for you, not him. He cast a look of dislike up at the huge house. You go on ahead now, mademoiselle. You look very cold. Rohan would have to have a broad expanse of steps leading up to his mansion, she thought dourly, starting the climb. She expected lights, gaiety, debauchery spilling out into the night time but the house seemed secure and quiet. She reached for the huge brass knocker, but before she could use it, the door opened, and an extremely proper-looking servant stared at her as if she was complete filth. He had to be French. His first words confirmed it. The servant's entrance is to the side, he said, and started to close the door in her face. She threw her body against it to halt him. I'm here to see his lordship. Just tell him Miss Harriman is here. The man's gaze flicked out at the wagon waiting for her, then back at her, and if anything, his look was even more disdainful. I have heard no mention of that name, he said haughtily, pushing on the door. Just ask him— The door slammed shut in her face. 
leaving her standing there, cold and furious. All right, she said beneath her breath. You asked for it. She stomped back down the snow-covered stairs, mentally thanking Mrs. Clark for her pilfered boots, and climbed up into the wagon. The servant's entrance it is, Roland. She'd lived such a strange life, so many extremes, and yet she'd never ventured into the servants' quarters of a great house. From her father's country house to the elegant Paris apartments where her mother and her lover had lived with passionate abandon, so much so that it had been up to Eleanor and Nanny Maud to bring up Lydia, they'd still remained sequestered from the servants' quarters. The apartments and houses grew shabbier, but somehow she'd yet to venture into the demi-world of working people. It was warm and clean in the back hallway. In the distance, she could hear the sounds of the servants talking as they worked on what must be dinner, and Eleanor wondered what it would be like to have the safety and warmth of honest labor. Perhaps she could become a servant. There was no task she particularly excelled at. She was too clumsy to be a chambermaid, too bad a seamstress to be a lady's maid, and a truly terrible cook. Perhaps a kitchen maid might be possible, under the watchful eye of some stern master chef, and she could— Mademoiselle, Roland interrupted her brief fantasy. If you go straight down that hallway, you'll find stairs to the main living quarters. You keep an eye out for Caval. He runs this place with an iron fist. Bless you, Roland, she said. I wish I had money— there is no need. I take pleasure from serving you, mademoiselle, he said, starting to bow. She leaned forward and kissed his leathered cheek, and he gave her a dazzling smile. And then she turned and headed off in search of her nemesis. The steps were narrow, with rough wood, clearly a servant's staircase, and she moved quietly. There was a closed door at the top, of course, and she hesitated for a moment. Once she entered the main part of the house, what would she do? Start searching the rooms until she found him, obviously, but exactly how she'd start the conversation was a problem, considering that she had to sneak into his house. That was his fault as well, for hiring a major domo who was such a... Uh, polite words evaded her and even in the privacy of her own mind she couldn't use the street words she'd unconsciously absorbed during the last few years. Batard would have to do. She pushed open the door very carefully and stepped into the lion's den. The space was warm, with the golden glow that came from only the best beeswax candles, the ones he had sent to her house, along with the blessed firewood and the food that she'd stormed off and missed. For a moment, she felt faint with hunger. She'd eaten nothing since the toast strips in the morning and the scone less than an hour ago, and it wasn't enough to keep her sturdy frame alive. She wasn't delicate like Lydia. She was taller, stronger, and she felt as if she'd been running some terrible, endless race. She would have given anything to lie down on one of the new beds they'd brought in and sleep for days. Anything but her sister's honor. And her own, what was left of it. She closed the door behind her and set off resolute. The door led into a series of formal rooms. Gilded woodwork, highly polished floors, mirrors all around. She'd heard stories of Versailles and the Hall of Mirrors. Surely this rivaled those places. Despite what little she knew of Lord Rohan, she was uncomfortably aware that his fortune was enormous. As were the marble stairs she eventually confronted. She moved up slowly, keeping to the edge in case an overzealous servant should appear. But it was evening and most of them would be discreetly absent unless summoned.
She remembered that much from her family's more affluent times. She wandered the hallways of the first floor, peering into rooms. She found a library, redolent of leather and pipe tobacco, a pretty little salon clearly designed for the woman of the house, clearly never used, a music room with the piano fort and harp. At the end of one hall was the ballroom, dark and silent. At the opposite end, a locked door. She pressed her ear against the door, but all was silent. Whatever that room was used for, and she shuddered to think, it was empty now. She had no choice but to climb another flight of stairs, this one smaller, but no less magnificent. What if Roland was mistaken? What if she was wandering around the Viscount Rohan's townhouse with no one there? And then she heard the voices as she reached the top of the stairs. His, deep and melodious. And she held her breath, expecting a woman's reply. Instead, a man's voice, the words too indistinct for her to decipher. She moved out of the shadows, heading in the direction of that room when her rival from the front door suddenly reappeared, carrying a tray with a carafe and glasses. You, the butler said in tones of extreme loathing, too much the professional to drop the tray. He set it down carefully on a table, but she was already off, racing in the direction of those voices. A door was open, light spilling out into the hallway, with her goal just beyond it. She'd almost reached it, her booted feet no longer silent on the parquet floor, when the major domo caught up with her, catching her hair and yanking her back painfully. She bit him hard and kicked him in the shins with Lady Carlton's boots, and she heard her dress tear as she lunged forward, skittering through the open door to greet the room's inhabitants, who stared at her in shocked silence. Nine. At least the scarred man, Redding, appeared suitably shocked, Eleanor thought. Lord Rohan, as always, was a different matter. He appeared to be expecting her, the wretch. He was sitting in splendid state in the middle of a huge bed hung with gloriously gilded curtains, his hair loose around his shoulders, and he was completely naked at least as far as she could tell. He had covers pulled to his waist, but it still left far too much flesh exposed, and she wasn't supposed to be thinking about that when her nemesis came skidding around the corner after her. Lord Rohan made no effort to cover himself. He merely smiled at her. You shouldn't look so surprised, Charles. It's my darling poppet from last night. Clearly she couldn't bear to be parted from me. Did I tell you we slept together? Twice? And extremely pleasant it was. Redding made a choking sound. Pleasant. His lordship is misleading you as always, Eleanor said. I fell asleep in his presence. Not everyone finds him as entertaining as you seem to. Do you see why she enchants me, Redding? Rohan said and then his gaze and voice hardened to steel. You didn't offer Miss Harriman any insult, did you, Caval? I should be most displeased if she were not treated with the utmost care and respect. She glanced behind her. The major domo was the color of parchment, and she could swear she could hear his knees knocking. There was no question that he was terrified. Of course he treated me with care and respect, she said in a crabby voice, taking pity on the man. He simply wished to announce my presence to give you time to cover yourself like any decent Christian, but I was in too much of a hurry and I ran ahead. Indeed, he said, clearly not believing a word she said. You always run around in torn clothes and your hair halfway down your back. You may go, Caval. We'll discuss this later. Yes, my lord, the man said, his voice quaking. Then Rohan's dark blue eyes focused on her.
And what in heaven's name made you think I was a decent Christian, child? I am affronted. She took a deep, steadying breath. There is always hope, Monsieur le Comte. I wish to speak to you. And here you are, my precious. Is it a private matter? Redding will be more than happy to leave us. Come sit beside me. He patted the snow-white sheets. If I am to entertain a woman in my bedroom, I prefer to keep them in close quarters. And I prefer you to put clothes on. Why? He sounded like the soul of reason. For the first time, she noticed the bandage on his arm. You've been hurt, she said, momentarily distracted. A trifle, he dismissed it. Why do you want me to put clothes on? I will not have a discussion with a... a naked man. It's distracting. His soft laugh was maddening. Very well, my sweet. In that case, Redding had best take you to my sitting room while I ring for my valet, because I'm afraid that under these covers I'm as naked as the devil made me, and if you aren't going to join me, you should retire before you faint with shock. Come along, Miss Harriman, Mr. Redding said, taking her arm. He's in one of his moods. It's wiser not to encourage him. We'll await him in the sitting room. He'd already begun to pull the covers away from his body, and she spun around, hoping the heat in her cheeks wasn't visible to the sardonic man by her side. The Kant's soft laugh followed her out into the adjoining room. Have a seat, Miss Harriman, her substitute host said. May I offer you something to drink? We can have Caval bring tea, or perhaps something a bit stronger. I fancy he's not over-fond of the stairs, and forcing him to run up and down them would be entertaining. No, thank you, sir. She perched herself on the edge of one slender gilt chair, determined not to show how exhausted she was. I trust your... family as well? Nothing untoward has brought you racing out into a snowy night? She heard that hesitation and she repressed an inner sigh. Everyone who saw her sister fell in love with her, and Redding was clearly no exception. My sister is fine, she said. There was a curious sweetness in Redding's scarred smile. If I can be of any assistance. This concerns Lord Rohan and myself, she said. He took a seat beside her on one of the little chairs. You're clearly an intelligent young woman. You must have realized that his lordship and I are particularly close. You can talk to me about whatever it is that troubles you. She didn't bother to suppress her skeptical expression. I'll await his lordship, thank you. This is between him and me. Oh, indeed it is. Redding smiled faintly. In which case I'll take my leave. It's been weeks since I've been in town, and there are a number of friends and establishments I wish to revisit. I do realize that it's completely rude to abandon you like this, and I assure you it has nothing to do with the vast amount of respect I hold for you, but merely because I am a shallow soul who's a slave to my appetites. And I strongly suspect Rohan wants to be alone with you. The bonds of friendship, alas, outweigh the duties of polite behavior. He rose, took her hand, and bowed low over it. She jerked away before he could kiss it, her face flaming as she remembered the last time a man had kissed her hand, and exactly what had followed. But Redding merely smiled at her, that peculiar twisted smile, and was gone. She had a moment's panic when he closed the door behind him. Her initial rage had settled enough for her to have the sudden horrifying thought, what in heaven's name was she doing? It wasn't as if help was coming from any other quarter. Surely she could have accepted Rohan's charity without offering her sister as virgin sacrifice. As for her own sense of honor, 